President Watkins, go ahead. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. We are calling this meeting to order at 5.30 p.m. We will start with our flex loop. Stands one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Great, thanks everybody. Uh, we'll start with our roll call. Let the record reflect that all four trustees are present. Uh, next, moving on to the approval of tonight's agenda. Motion to approve the agenda for tonight. Second. Thank you, Trustee Proctor, for the motion and Trustee Brooks for the second. All those in favor, unmute and say aye. 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 Or zero. Thank you. Um, moving on to approval of minutes. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you, Trustee Chin, for the motion and Trustee Cooks for the second. All those in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 Great. Motion passes score is zero. Moving on to public statements related to non agenda topics. The San Mateo Foster City School Board cannot act upon any matter that has not been included and publicly posted on the agenda except under limited circumstances as permitted by law. The board may refer matters raised in this forum to staff for investigation and or action where appropriate. Please limit your statements to three minutes. We do have some folks in the audience this evening, so we'll start with the audience uh, for public comment and then move on to folks on Zoom. Are there any audience members that have public comment? Okay, seeing none. Forrest, if you could check with our Zoom audience. Yes, thank you, President Watkins. I will be calling on members of the audience to make public comment. You will be given three minutes to make public comment, and there will be a timer that will make an announcement at one minute remaining, as well as five seconds remaining, and then we will move on to our next commenter once the time has allotted. Please wait while I bring in our first public. And forgive me if I mispronounce any names. Zoya, I'm going to allow you to talk and you will have three minutes. Go ahead and start when ready. Hello, um, I hope I can be succinct and I wrote most of it. So I'm going to read part of it because I am nervous. And when I speak, um, I, I get nervous. So I think when I write it, it's you can understand my point. I am Zoya Salome and I am a first grade teacher at Beresford. Um, I'm really here because um, I'm on an amazing committee uh, called the Culturally Responsive Curriculum and Practice uh, Task Force. And um, I'm honored to be on this committee. Um, and it's a committee um, that is made up of teachers, classified staff, uh, principals, um, parents uh, from our district. And we also have members outside of our district uh, who are through the San Mateo Union High School District. So it's a very comprehensive group of people and it, it's, it's a beautiful place to be. I fe always feel honored. We meet monthly and it's a treat, honestly. Um, I'm here to just draw attention to, to our committee and our committee work. A lot, Lots of my statements are broad at this point, but you'll be hearing and seeing a little bit more of us as we uh, create and recreate and revise our, um, our policies uh, and statements and, and uh, principles that we are trying to create. Um, basically, um, our task force, we work to uphold, maintain, and create student dignity and community through effective, culturally responsive practices and policies. Um, just this last week, we created our guiding principles, which we will present to you um, on a different day. 
No, not now. We know that dignity and positive self-esteem is directly linked to achievement. And because cultural responsiveness requires individuals to be culturally proficient, our task force is creating policies and procedures to support cultural proficiency. Cultural proficiency is having an awareness of one's own culture and identity and views about differences and the abilities to learn and build on the varying cultural and community norms of our students and their families. Honoring our, honoring our students and various cultural, cultural experiences through this task force is integral to the success of each and every one of our students. Please, let's keep the culturally responsive curriculum and practice task force in the forefront of our minds because our students need and deserve classrooms reflecting practices that dignify uplift them and push their learning and human interconnectedness i am clearly passionate about this topic on this task force uh we meet ongoing monthly we will continue to meet throughout the year and i hope our work will continue throughout the years because our babies who are not really babies they're their own people, but our beautiful children depend on this. Um, thank you for your time. And I hope um, to be able to bring you more information on another day. That's all. Thank you so much, Zoya, for sharing. I'm going to be moving on to the next public commenter. Please keep your hands raised. And Marcella, I'm going to allow you to talk. Please begin when ready. You will have three minutes. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to share that I had the opportunity. First, I loved Zoya's comments, but also um, I had the opportunity yesterday to attend a community convening on dismantling the school to prison pipeline that was well attended by a variety of community members. Um, it was a great reminder that our school is influenced by, by our community and our community is influenced by our school. I was so proud of our district for hosting events like this, and I look forward to additional opportunities to engage the community at large as we continue to advance the goals that we have for our students and for our district. So I just wanted to say thank you, and, um, and I look forward to more of that. Reporting in progress. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your comments. Uh, President Watkins, we have no other commenters who would like to make a public statement. Uh, back to you. Great, thank you. Okay. Oh, can we turn that? Uh -huh. Yeah? Okay. Nope. Good. Perfect. Okay. Sorry to folks on Zoom. We're having technological difficulties. Uh, all right. Public statements related to agenda items. Persons will be called on at the appropriate time. We are moving on to foundation, committee, and PTA council reports. Who would like to begin? Um, I attended my very first meeting um, as the liaison for the Sanctuary Task Force today, and um, it was a great, great meeting. I really enjoyed myself, and we talked about um, the two goals for the year, the SMART goals, one being uh, around parent education nights, and the second being um, creating a list of family resources. So we broke out into groups and um, brainstormed, and the work will continue, and we will uh, come up with those items in the future. So. That is my report. Thank you, Trustee Proctor. There are other foundation and committee reports. Um, I also attended my first uh, San Mateo Education, uh, San Mateo Positivity Education Foundation uh, meeting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I, there was a bunch of um, topics discussed, but the most important one that I wanted to highlight today is that we are in the middle of our readathon. It started January 20th and it ends on February 3rd. Um, and so I just want to encourage everyone to go out there and read.
Superintendent Ochoa, we have added PTA Council reports. Is there someone representing PTA Council this evening who will be giving a report? Thank you, President Watkins. We wanted to be able to add. Trying to arrange having that um, presentation here, um, but I think we also, um, if we do have any members from our PTA President's Council who are on the call, and as you know, there um, looks like 40 to send a message to managers. Arrange for our next meeting. Um, request we will include that in um, structure. I don't know, Superintendent Choi, your your mic was cutting in and out. So I think while everybody in in this room heard that, um, you. Uh, you were in and out there. Well, President Watkins, if I can come back to you. Um, I don't know if you want to summarize. Yeah, so, so I'll just give a brief, brief summary of Superintendent Ochoa. Um, we are working on integrating PTA Council um, and we'll ensure that representatives are aware about the opportunity for them to share as well. Um, also just wanted to, as Superintendent Ochoa mentioned, 46 people, uh, participants online and about 10, 15 <laughs> individuals, I'm really bad with eyeballing numbers, uh, individuals in the audience. Um, can we also make a translation announcement, please? Superintendent Ochoa? Okay. We can move on and as soon as you join, we'll make that translation announcement. Thank you. Uh, we will be moving on to SNEDA, CSEA and SNEA updates. So um, Forrest, if you want to bring those representatives in, that would be great. And Superintendent Ocho, I see you're back. Do you want to quickly make that? Y si tengo más de dos años esperando que llegue este día, ustedes en, presentes en esta junta saben que por más de dos años hemos tenido la miembro de la mesa directiva, Noelia Corso, um, dar este mensaje. Así que ahora ya uh, es mi época uh, en que compartir esto con los presentes. Pero si alguien uh, ocupa intérprete, um, si tenemos eso disponible, uh, haga clic en el mundo en su pantalla y la junta se traduce en, en español a la misma vez. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Ochoa. Forrest, turning it over to you for our SMIA, CSCA and SMIA representatives. Uh, one moment while I bring you in as a panelist, and then you will be allowed to share a video. And can we turn audio on back in the boardroom so that people here can hear? Of course, thank you. One moment. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Are we good? Oh, good. So I'm happy to report that I have absolutely nothing to report. So that's great. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to thank our maintenance and operations classified employees for their response to all of the storms that happened earlier at the or tail end of last year and beginning of this year. Um, and that's all I've got. Thank you, Alicia.
Uh, uh, good evening, uh, Superintendent Choa and our board members and public. Uh, actually, tonight I wanted to start out by saying um, how SMEDA really stands with the communities in Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay, uh, especially those in the Asian American Pacific Islander communities. Um, we definitely, uh, over the past couple, this past week, a lot of classrooms, not only just in our district, but actually throughout the world, country and the world are uh, taking the kindness challenge. And we really believe in uh, spreading that message of kindness and inclusion throughout of our, our classrooms. And so seeing, you know, just that we can build a better world for uh, who we're with. Um, I do, so I wanted to start out by saying that um, I also uh, have something to report. Um, yesterday, our bargaining team met with the district yesterday. Uh, we worked on our middle school MOU um, block schedule, MOU uh, adjusting that for the coming year. Um, we came to a tentative agreement. We'll be taking that back to our middle school members for a vote. Um, let's see, we also, um, SMEDA is really continues to believe that professional, like quality professional development um, really makes for quality teachers. And we're really proud to be able to send up to 20 of our newest um, teachers, those within the their first and first through third years of teaching to, um, we could spend up, to, uh, we're sending up to 20 uh, new to the new educators weekend. Um, we're looking forward to hearing about the experiences that they have at that um, conference. And I guess I guess in the in the idea of the kindness challenge, I would love to challenge everybody in leadership in the San Mateo Foster City School District just to remember that we have you know 590 but 600 ish educators and all of our classified staff that really are working hard every day uh, to bring quality education to our our members are uh, to our students and how important it is to interact with us with kindness, thinking before you speak, before you sit head stand, because when we are treated as professionals, we can treat everybody um, with that general sense of kindness. And so that's what I'm gonna leave with you today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I think we have some SMEA members here in person to share an update. All right, take three. Good evening. My name is Jessica Nadi, principal of okay. <laughs> Burrell Middle School. And I uh, wanted to share some awesome happenings from the Bobcat community. Uh, we've had a great first half of the year and thanks to district support, we opened a wellness center that is a place for student counseling and hangouts. We added a fourth counselor expanding our multilingual support for students and families. CCE, which stands for College Career Exploration Lab, which is a hands-on experience where students are working together exploring careers like fashion design, renewable energy, and culinary arts. We've increased camera coverage to capture activities on campus. We continue to have a robust math team with three coaches, and the teachers are always collaborating to provide top-tier instruction. 
Our ELA teachers are approaching a collaborative pilot adoption for a new curriculum. Our science team is working together on the hands-on implementation of Open Sciad. And we have a new elective that puts students in leadership roles like our peer advocates who've been touring the district and speaking to parents about the harmful effects of vaping. Community service is an important value at Burrell. We've had campus cleanups that are well attended and we have an amazing PTA who volunteers at every event. Just recently, they recognized the majority of students at Burrell for their academic efforts and or their demonstration of Bobcat pride, positive, reflective, inclusive, determined, and empathetic. The PTA is also organizing on March 2nd, our cultural fair festival. This is a time where there's food, cultural artifacts, entertainment, and we have 18 countries represented. It's open to the public and it's a fabulous opportunity to learn about different cultures and get to know each other better and have fun. Our hardworking teachers and staff are dedicated to our strategic plan goals. We are a large campus, so we've organized into committees focused on safety, wellness, student achievement, and equity. Each committee has collected data to inform site-specific work for continual improvement to support all students. We um, also have our second uh, reclassification um, celebration where we are reclassifying another round of 15 plus students. We will celebrate them at our next ELAC meeting. And we had two incoming info sessions for sixth grade with over 500 people attending collectively. And we just want to say thanks again to district parent and staff support. Burrell is a special place. We just had amazing band, orchestra, jazz, and chorus concerts this week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, with basketball playoffs at the same time in our new gym. One great way to connect with us is to check out the original Burrell alumni original musical, Jinx, which is set to hit Sam Pack on March 3rd through 5th. It is going to be amazing. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. I'm gonna to try to say this in Mandarin. It, as you know, it's, it is Lunar New Year, the year of the rabbit. And um, so I am the uh, proud principal of College Park Elementary School, new to San Mateo Foster City School District and extremely happy to be part of the team. So the way you say happy Lunar New Year, Xin Xi Kwai Lao, okay? Um, I brought with me, um, I just wanna share some high leadership highlights that I've appreciated as someone new to San Mateo Foster City with respect to the equity work. I really appreciate the focus on implicit bias. That's what we're all engaging in throughout the district. I feel like it's amazing. We had a district-wide PD last week, Tuesday, which was district-wide, it's amazing. And all the principals were responsible to continue with that learning. Um, I've appreciated the push um, from and support from Superintendent Ochoa. He's really encouraged us to attend um, the AXA Equity PDs, which I'm really excited about. I know my colleagues are as well. And what we've been doing as leaders is joining in, in PLCs, principal PLCs. We've been visiting each other's schools. Last week, College Park had our visit and we, we changed it up a bit. Um, because we are a unique school, uh, what I requested is that can we, can you come in? So this is principals from nine, oh, it's nine schools total and some uh, central office staff and get a pulse on how students at College Park are engaging and experiencing learning. It was an amazing experience and we had teacher leaders on the learning walk as well. So big highlights for College Park. I would say one big one that I think you all know, which came to a pleasant surprise is that College Park, along with um, uh, North Shore View, we both received the California Distinguished Award. And we're gonna be going with the superintendent and College Park will be bringing the PTA president and one of the founding teachers. Um, there's a lot of happenings at College Park. I'm just going to tell you, it is an amazing community, very committed to the work, um, very hardworking staff. We are working to create a, a place of belonging and working hard every day. It is a beautiful com a community. I really want to invite you over next week because um, 
we have been invited to uh, participate in the Lunar New Year Parade in San Francisco, and I'm going to be marching along with them. And I'm so impressed with the dedication and the practice. So um, one thing I really want to highlight for College Park, for the first time in many years, we have our ELAC chair, Mr. Alberto Belmudez, Bel who is our, he is not only our EL, ELAC chair, he is also our DLAC representative, and he is committed, so committed and very passionate. Um, he attended a Kabe conference in the fall and came back ready to lead as a parent. So I'm going to um, let him take the floor. <laughs> good evening, everybody. So it's just, I have, I mean, I'm not too expert on this one, but I feel so blessed, so glad to be part of this one. Um, something short, um, I have no words. I just, I feel thanks with the school. It's amazing school. It's my first experience to doing these kind of things. I have a 19 years old daughter and a five years old son. My son is full uh, Spanish speaker. So, for me, it's like a big surprise seeing my little kid speaking Mandarin. And my daughter, she learned a little bit at uh, high school. And I remember this is an experience for me. One day when I get home, I'm open the door and I hear my daughter and my son speak on Mandarin. I'm like, this is my house. <laughs> yeah, but this, this is one of the, a lot of things, the one I can feel proud of my district, my school, my family. I mean, this is amazing. This is a good, good uh, job. Uh, from the school to the parents and I try I I really like to be part of this one because I want to be part of my son and a lot of kids progress so thank you everybody thank you so much for me representatives and thank you so much for your words <laughs> as well it's always wonderful to hear from other folks in our community. All right, we are moving on to board announcements. Um, I will just announce that um, since our last meeting, I have judged two spelling bees in our school district, uh, San Mateo Park, and then today Foster City Elementary School. So um, I enjoy participating in those and getting a chance to see um, some kids that have worked really, really hard and studied hard. So I just want to let you guys know that I did that. And also thank Trustee Watkins and Superintendent Ochoa for last night's presentation. I had to leave a little early, but it was wonderful. And I wish I could have stayed the whole time and um, it was well attended and just really fabulous. So thank you. Other board announcements. President Watkins, I have no announcements at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll make a brief announcement. Um, I know Trustee Proctor and Marcella made um, some comments, but the district collaborated with REACH, which is an organization of elected officials of color in San Mateo County and Fresh Lifelines for Youth, which is an organization. Can we turn that off? Can we just turn that down or off? Otherwise, the echo. Thank you. Um, Fresh Lifelines for Youth, which is an organization that supports youth that have uh, been involved in the juvenile justice system. Um, and does a lot of advocacy work and collaborated on an event where we talked about uh, kind of the history uh, and um, an overview of the school to prison pipeline. Some of the work that we have done in this district, uh, much of which was shared at our study session a couple of weeks ago um, and had an opportunity for community members to engage in a couple of different breakout sessions around the school to prison pipeline more generally around kind of some of the practice and implementation components and some of the policy pieces. So I think we had 
50 to 60 folks in attendance, a wide range of community members. So some of our community um, partners, such as Peninsula Family Services and Boys and Girls Club, um, both of our police departments were represented. We had some of our elected officials, uh, Supervisor Corzo and uh, San Mateo City Council member Lorraine, um, in addition to a wide variety of other stakeholders and folks that are um, uh, engaged in in um, work with with youth and with law enforcement, et cetera. And so um, it was a great event and there was a lot of energy for um, the conversation to continue. So uh, we'll see what that means in terms of next steps, but um, really was really grateful to all of the district staff. You guys would not have believed what our district, mm -hmm. what our boardroom looked like. It was very, um, it was set up beautifully with candles and uh, music and a wonderful dinner. And so again, really get, grateful to the district and all of the staff that helped to put that on and to make it a really special event for all of our attendees. It didn't stay for today's board meeting. I did tell Superintendent Ochoa, like, this is now what we expect for board meetings. And, you know, here we are. <laughs> um, right, right. All right. Uh, it seems like there are no more announcements, so we will move on to the superintendent report. Superintendent Ochoa, over to you. Thank you, President Watkins. Um, First and foremost, a huge thank you to the many, many educators and staff in this school district. Um, when there is violence that takes place in our community and just over the hill in Half Moon Bay, uh, I think we're all aware of the terrible tragedy that took place uh, as well as in uh, Monterey Park, California, Southern California. Um, it really leads our our team members to to think about how we can work together and support one another and be mindful of um of how precious all of our lives are and how precious the children that we get to educate every day are and i'm just thankful to the staff members that um came to work and talked to kids and our teenagers about what they were going through and reacting to everything that has taken place over the last couple of, of weeks. And um, and it's in addition to all of the other things that go along with being an educator in this district. So I'm looking at some of the those educators in here. Those of you that are in here with me in person, thank you. Um, but also those that are watching or who will watch this later from a very sincere thank you. Um, and also a recognition of our SMEDA board president's comments about the importance of all of our administrators in this district being being really thoughtful about being kind in our communications um, as a as a longtime administrator and and um, as the superintendent in the district. I think we often want to go back and say, oh, I wish I could have written that a little bit nicer or thought to include this sentence or take out this um, or rewrite it. Um, and I think it's really important for us to hear our partners when they point that out. And so thank you, um, President Pratt for, uh, Smita President Pratt for pointing that out tonight. Um, I do want to uh, spend a little bit of time talking about our district's um, experience going through these historic torrential rains that have happened in the last couple of weeks. As you know, we did cancel school as a result of the rains. And um, I think most in the community have a sense of how their neighborhood responded to the rains and maybe how their child's school responded to the rain. So you may think our school didn't really fare so poorly or our neighborhood seemed to do okay. Uh, but I do want to share some of the bigger picture in the district, um, it, starting with San Mateo Park Elementary. That school had a very, very massive tree come down um, in the playground. Um, and so that isn't something that a couple of folks just walk over and pick up. We actually had to bring in a contractor who spent pretty much the entire day after the rains out there uh, breaking the tree down into size, and that tree is gone. It, and it's a humongous tree that that um, would have, you know, had anyone been there, really caused significant damage, um, or fallen the other direction, would have actually hit the school building. So um, 
that's an example of a school that was, you know, not really accessible to kids um, after that first heavy rain. We also had uh, over at Parkside Elementary School, three classrooms, three separate classrooms that had significant uh, leak issues in the roofs. And so those classrooms were, you know, had standing water in, in them. Um, Foster City, which is here uh, closer to the district office and has, um, you know, gone through a pretty significant upgrade in the last, you know, the last 10 years or so. Um, that school ended up having a variety of issues having to do with drainage and having to do with um, uh, sewer. And so uh, we actually had two classrooms that were completely, uh, you know, inaccessible to kids because of how much water entered the rooms as a result of the rain. So we had a team of four or five uh, school district employees there um, really untangling all the issues that happened at that school. Uh, in addition to that, Sunny Bray, which is uh, um, in a different part of town, of course, Sunny Bray had, um, we called it the Sunny Bray Pond, the Sunny Bray uh, Pool. It, it had a humongous pool of water in that um, it was actually in the construction area because we're building a beautiful multi-purpose room that's going to open uh, you know in the future and that area had very significant water pooling essentially but it also affected the playground there were also issues in various classrooms at the school um, so as this is all happening we are uh, one of the more complicated school districts in San Mateo County because we have so many different sites in so many different geographic areas throughout the region. So I just wanted to share some of those um, examples to give the, the community an idea of the complexity of a response when uh, the district experiences rains such as those. And then my um, Next comments will be about a document we sent out to the community. I encourage you all to view the document. Diego Perez, our coordinator of communications, many thanks to, to Diego for assisting and designing and putting it together. And with our technology, we're actually able to see how many people open it and how long you read it. So, um, you know, within a day, close to a thousand views now on the document that we sent out. It's an update that really is a celebration for our district. Our district was rated high in academics in ELA and math according to the California dashboard so I want to encourage all those uh, attending online to go to the dashboard ca-dashboard.org and view it for yourselves I think it'll be an eye-opener for you because you can type in each individual school or you can look up a district you can also look up the state of California as a whole which was rated low in math and low in ELA whereas the San Mateo Foster City School District is rated high in math and high in ELA and there's a rubric posted online so I encourage you I know a thousand of you already read it and you spent an average of six minutes and 22 seconds when you did so um, but really want to encourage others to log into that and then finally we are excited about having our sister city partners from Inagi City Japan here February 4th a delegation is coming uh, to make their visit to Foster City. I know several of our school board members are excited as well, preparing remarks to do that. We will be hosting the group at Beach Park Elementary School, and I am just very much looking forward to that. Many thanks to Steve Okamoto and a team of representatives from the city of Foster City who've helped plan the visit. And uh, those are my remarks for tonight. Great, thank you so much, Superintendent Ochoa. We will move on to the proposed consent agenda. Um, all items on the consent agenda are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion in the form listed below. There will be no discussion on these items prior to the time the board votes on the motion unless members of the board, staff, or public request specific items be removed and discussed from the consent agenda. The superintendent and staff recommend approval of all consent items. Movement of any recommended consent item is appropriate at this time. Uh, are there any board members that would like to remove a consent item? I'd like to uh, pull item 4A3, please. Okay, thank you, Trustee Chin. Anybody else? I would, I would like, like to pull 4C3, please. please. Thank you, Trustee Proctor. Any others? 
Okay, uh, Forrest, if you can check with the public, um, with the folks, uh, any folks in the audience that would like to remove an item from the consent agenda. Seeing none, Forrest, if you can check the Zoom audience, please. Thank you, President Proctor, and good evening. I will be calling on speakers to make public comment in a random order. Uh, to our attendees, if you would like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature within Zoom now. And as a reminder, if you are calling in, you can dial star nine to raise your hand using the mobile. Um, speakers will have three minutes to make their remarks. And I will be calling on those members now. And President Watkins, it appears that there are no members in the audience that would like to make public comment. Great, thank you. Um, so I will need someone to make a motion uh, to approve the consent agenda, agenda with the exception of the two um, items that Trustee Chin and Trustee Proctor pulled. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda uh, absent uh, items 4A3 and 4 C three. I'll second. Thank you, Trustee Chen, for the motion, and Trustee Proctor for the second. All those in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 The motion passes four zero. We will now move on to item four a three. Superintendent Ocho, do you have anything you want to share about this item? Thank you, President Proctor, just President Watkins. <laughs> a year of saying that, you just kind of get used to it. Um, item 4A3 <laughs> is our ratification of contracts and consultants under 45,000 pursuant to board policy 3312 by majority vote um, to be able to approve these expenses and the list of contracts and consultants. Um, there is not much else to it. Great, thank you, Superintendent Ochoa. Are there board questions on this item? Okay, we can move on with a motion for this item. Um, I'll make a motion, motion to, to approve, approve for a Thank you, Trustee Proctor for the motion and Trustee Brooks for the second. All those in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Same. Okay. Four yeses and Trustee Chin. Sorry, three yeses, one abstention. Trustee Chin, thank you. And now moving on to 4C3, Superintendent Ocho. Good evening, Board of Trustees. Um, this item is a request from the board to approve a consulting agreement partnership with uh, Nikki Eddy, who is a consultant with almost 20 years of experience working in the field of LGBTQ plus um, support for school districts. Um, as you know, we do have a task force uh, with this um, commitment to this work, which is aligned to our strategic plan and our wellness goal you know, to provide a safe, caring, nurturing environment, uh, being culturally responsive to all our students. Um, this work this year would really involve Nikki Eddy coming to work with our counselors, our middle school counselors. Um, she would support them first by gathering data and doing surveys, talking to people, finding out what we know, what we've been doing, and then coming actually and coaching and working with um, middle school counselors who, who directly impact these students. Um, as well as staff, other staff members, and working with our task force and parents as well. So I'm very, very excited about having someone who's an expert in this field to, to support us. So that's that item. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Hills. I'm turning it over to the board for any clarifying questions that you have on this item. Okay, and I did forget to turn it over to public comment for the last item. So if, uh, Forrest, if you could open this up um, uh, for public comment on this item, and if, though we already voted, if folks have comments on for A3, 
um, you can also comment on that. Uh, thank you, President Watkins, and good evening. I will be opening it up to public comment for remarks on 4A3 and 4C3. Audience and the members, please use the raise hand functionality within Zoom now. We do have one member in the audience that is going to be making public comment soon. However, I would like to remind audience using mobile apps to use that star nine dial in order to raise hand using the mobile apps. And again, you'll be having three minutes to give their public remarks. Apologies in advance if I mispronounce any names. With that, Randy Painter, go ahead and begin. You will have three minutes to speak. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, so um, yeah, as a, a point of order, I had hoped to speak to the last point before the vote, but the um, public comment was not called for uh, the last point. But um, I noticed that Trustee Chin abstained, um, had, had pulled the item for the last the last item for uh, the consent agenda and then abstained on that vote. And I had also noticed that there was a point in that last item that where Superintendent Ochoa said that there was nothing much to mention, but I had previously noticed that um, Trustee Chin was actually listed in that um, item as uh, receiving a reimbursement, but also on there as a uh, recipient for a standing um, what is it, a standing purchase order? So I'm just curious, why does he have like this open purchase order? And if there can be any comment for public transparency about that. Thank you. Thank you, Randy, for your comment. I'm moving on to the next public commenter, Marcella. You will be brought in to be allowed to talk. You will have three minutes and go ahead and start when ready. Hi, thank you. Um, something that would be helpful, I think, for the public and some of the consent agenda items, and this one in particular, is uh, an understanding of uh, of the law and kind of how this is built in. I know this is a question I've had regularly, um, but hadn't asked before. The, if the contracts are 45,000 and under in aggregate, or if they only have to meet that $45,000 mark per period, because that makes a big difference in terms of how money is being spent in the district. So it was it's more of a clarification point, but I do think that um, many of the items that we talk about related to the budget are difficult for the average um, attendee or or community member to understand. So any opportunity to explain that I think would be appreciated. Thank you. Great. It looks like we have no additional public comment. Thank you, Forrest, and thank you to the public comment. Um, and again, apologies for overlooking the public comment uh, prior to our vote. Uh, Patrick, are you able to provide any clarification on the questions that were asked? Yes, thank you. Um, my recollection is this particular item for Trustee Chin was a reimbursement related to a conference that he attended. And I don't recall the exact amount, but that's uh, fairly standard. If there's a reimbursement being sought, then we'll... Uh, open up a PO so that in order to process the payment for the items being reimbursed. So, and um, and in regards to the, the threshold question, the 45K, um, this has been a practice in our district for some time uh, of, of bringing forward these items for ratification um, in regards to the consultant amounts. Districts have different thresholds, but this has been a practice in the district for some time. There's, there's in terms of, um, uh, parameters around um, professional development services, or if it's construction, there's a lot of other, um, there's a lot more depth to some of those things. But um, this is, we brought this forward, this just had this practice some time about bringing forward for ratification these contracts at these thresholds. Um, and some districts have it in their board policies too that designate certain thresholds that the superintendent or designees have authorization to enter into. And uh, this board as well too adopted a resolution too, which authorizes the superintendent and designees to enter into contracts for construction purposes, and they're brought back forward to the brought to the board for ratification. Um, so hopefully that answers the question. I can go more in depth 
but uh I think part of part of the question um Patrick was around whether that amount is under 45 kind of per per board meeting I guess that were or per particular pay period or whether it's over the course of an academic year like under well we bring forward this item to every board meeting so this is disclosing to the public and to the board to all the contracts we're into at, at this threshold so we, this is a standing action standing item on every board meeting yes I'm not asking this correctly oh. I know that oh. um sorry can, can I can I chime in please um You'll have a vendor who provides a service that is time bound in such a way that it covers 12 months because the service is part of a, um, a process that the district has. So an example of one would be we uh, request consultative work related to um, conducting our annual um, uh CalPADS, uh, which is our district system for monitoring student enrollment data, student completion data, and a contract such as that will come up once. It'll typically come a few months before the work starts, and then you won't see that contract come back again. Other contracts, because of the nature of the service being provided, uh, Davy Tree Specialist is a good example. When they come out to do work for us related to a weather event, it will be uh, uh, typically less than $45,000. But three months later, we'll need to add Davy Tree Specialists again because we bring them out for a different purpose. And those aren't necessarily always predictable, but they do take place. And what we try to do if the known portion of the expense is more than $45,000, we typically bring it as a separate item outside of the contracts under $45,000 uh, to essentially um, have it as a standalone if it's something that's going to be a substantial expense. An example would be a couple months into my tenure, we uh, entered into a contract with new leaders, consultative work. It was uh, several hundred thousand dollars. It was set aside. It was discussed, um, you know, individually and apart from all of the other contracts under forty-five thousand dollars. And then the remainder are um, included in that item for under forty-five thousand um, dollars. The other thing I think it's important for the public and for all of our stakeholders to be cognizant of these school board. Um, uh documents they live online they remain online so i really want to encourage our public at any point in time to uh, click into these documents review them go through and and contact us and ask us those questions because we have a team of of professionals who know these contracts very well and can give all manner of clarification for anybody that would want that clarification Great, thank you, uh, Patrick and Superintendent Ochoa. Um, we will now move on to any board statements related to, we are now on 4C3. Um, yeah, so yeah, I pulled so this, I pulled item, this item, not because, not because I, I had any questions, questions or issues. I just, I just wanted to kind of highlight this because um, I think this is great. I wanted to thank the task force for bringing this and, and all district staff that are um, supporting this. I think um, making sure that our counselors are, um, prepared and uh, have the tools necessary to um, address these anything with students, um, I'm all in support. And so I just wanted to make sure that everybody kind of saw this one a little, a little extra than the rest. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Proctor. Any other comments? We will need a motion for this item, please. I'll make, I'll a, make motion a motion to approve 4C3. Thank you, Trustee Proctor, for the motion. Trustee Brooks for the second. All those in favor, please. All those in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 The motion passes 4 0. Thank you. All right. We will move on to. Hmm. The numbers. Okay. Uh, 5A. Resolution number 21-22-23, authorizing the issuance of 2020 general obligation bonds. Yes, good evening, and thank you so much for uh, taking some time this evening to talk about this particular item. First of all, I want to thank our community for the tremendous support of our schools. Um, the action you're going to take this evening is going to enable us to move forward with the sale of the next series of bonds from Measure T. Um, and um, this is having a tremendous impact on our schools and our students and community. Um, just for context, 
Uh, the first issuance of Measure T, we sold $100 million, and to date, we've sent about $65 million. We expect to send the remaining $35 million by June of this year, 2023. Um, the action you're taking this evening enables us to proceed to work with um, our financial advisor, Chet Wang, and his team, our bond council. Uh, we'll work with Standard & Poor's and Moody's to work on ratings before the bonds are sold. That's part of what you're taking action on tonight to enable us to have those dialogues. Um, from a cash flow perspective, uh, you'll take action this evening to approve this. It enables us to work with the rating agencies in February and prepare for the bonds to be sold in March. We'll receive the cash in April. And we had a significant amount of conversation. I want to thank Amy and her team for their incredible work on the projects and managing these projects for our community. Um, we spent time with Chet as well, too, in trying to make sure that the sale of the next bond um, is at a time when we nearly depleted the first bond. So again, cash flow wise, we have spent $65 million to date. As of January, we are anticipating spending the remaining $35 million by June. We'll sell the bonds in the March timeframe. We'll have cash for this next $150 million in April. So about a two month overlap between the sale of this bond and the remaining expenditures associated with the first issuance. And then from a cash flow perspective, we anticipate that this $150 million will be spent by the end of Q3 of 2024. Thank you. So again, uh, I'm really, I just want to compliment again, the team, uh, everyone who's been involved in this, Amy for her leadership and our team uh, who've done this really incredible job managing these projects. And uh, our board has, and community has been really ambitious about moving forward with these projects really quickly um, and, and managing the financial impact and the cash flow so that the support we have from our community, we're doing our due diligence to not sell bonds until the time we need that cash. So this also contemplates the demand for the cash, the management of the cash, the completion of the projects, and, um, and the impact to the community. So the steps you're taking tonight, you're gonna to adopt this resolution. There's a couple other components in here too. We have a preliminary official statement, which you have, there's some blanks in that, but we gave you the format to approve that enables to have the conversation with the rating agencies and ultimately that'll be information that people who acquire these bonds that information will be available to them about our district. Um, we also have um, the uh, contract that enables us to work with the underwriters who help us do the sale of the bond too. And, um, and I'm forgetting one other thing that's in here and um, let me just move up on my, oh, my, my screen froze. Oh, sorry, well, Page says it's unresponsive, sorry. Um, so the, um, the resolution, the, the preliminary, preliminary official statement, the former contract, and I'm trying to retrieve the fourth items in here by you adopting this tonight, enable us to move forward for the sale of the bonds and work with our financial advisor in order to make that happen. So we're asking for your approval of the resolution this, night, this evening. Thank you, Patrick. Turning over to the board for clarifying questions. Sure, uh, President Morgan. Uh, Mr. Patrick, uh, I would like to know if you can give us a little background on the firm that will be assisting us with the transaction. So uh, I've had the privilege of working with Chet for quite some time. Uh, he and his firm are gonna enable us to uh, proceed with the transaction. Um, and uh, Chet's got, I don't know how many years of experience altogether, Chet. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure he'd be happy to share some comments with you too, to, to uh, talk about his firm and his background. We'll work with legal counsel as well too. David Casanocho has helped us with um, not only the bond sales from Measure T, but Measure X and Measure L. He's worked with us for quite some time on uh, several of the, um, the bond sales. Um, and uh, Chet and his team from Keygent have been our financial advisor, help us with all of the financial disclosures we have to do as a district the reporting we have to do uh, prior to the sale, after the sale, um, and it's been a long-term relationship the district's had with those two particular entities. Um, and Chet, I don't know if you have any other comments of other folks that I may have missed speaking about. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other board clarifying questions? Okay. Uh, Forrest, if you could open it up to public comment, please. 
Thank you, President Watkins. Good evening, I'll be calling on speakers for public comment in a random order and to our audience, if you would like to make public comment, please use the raise hand feature within Zoom. Uh, you will be given three minutes to make your remarks and they'll be hearing a tone at 30 seconds and then when your time expires, we will move on to our next speaker. Um, please use that raise functionality, raise hand functionality now and apologies in advance if I mispronounce your name. And with that, President Watkins, there are no members in the audience that would like to make a public comment. Back to you. Thank you so much. And I forgot to ask the in-person audience, is there anyone in the audience that would like to make a public comment on this item? Okay, turning back over to the board for any comments. There's no comments. We, uh, I will take a motion on this item, please. I'll make a motion. I'll second the motion. Great, so motion by uh, Trustee Brooks and a second by Trustee Chin. All those in favor, please unmute and say aye. Say aye. 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 Passes 4-0, thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Moving on to 6A, classified employee seniority list. Good evening, trustees and Superintendent Ochoa. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thumbs up. So tonight we bring to you the annual classified list. Um, it's a seniority list and it is by um, job group. OK, so the peers are together. The custodial group is together and it's in order of seniority. We check with employees annually to make sure that the list is correct. And it's just our way of making sure that we have um, an accurate list should we need to uh, make any changes in the future. So we've already brought you the certificated list. And now this is the classified list and we kindly ask for your approval. Great, thank you, Diana. Are there any board clarifying questions? Okay. Seeing none, Forrest, if you could, uh, any public, Forrest, if you can, are there any public comments in the audience? Okay, turning it over, Forrest, public comment, please. Thank you, President Watkins. Uh, if there are any members in the audience that would like to make public comment, please use the raise hand function within Zoom now. You will be given three minutes to make your remarks. Apologies in advance if I mispronounce any names. And with that, President Watkins, there are no members in the audience that would like to make public comment. Back to you. Thanks so much. Turning it over to the board for clarifying for comments, sorry, not clarifying comments, comments. No roll tonight, no comment. Oh, Motion comment. to approve. I'll second. Great, thank you Trustee Chen for the motion and Trustee Brooks for the second. All those in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 Motion passes for zero. Thank you, Diana. Moving on to student services. We'll start with our preschool update. Hey, good evening, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Ochoa. Uh, very excited to have Christina Haley. She's the principal of Turnbull and the preschool programs in our district. She's going to provide a, a, an update to you all um, with the preschool program. So thank you, Christina. to plan. It has literally been the first time that preschool has been a part of our long-term commitment to our students and working together. Um, Christine, I'm sorry to interrupt. So However, you are not presenting on Zoom. Um, opportunity for us. Thank you also for the opportunity. Oh, we have to stop. Hello. No. Yes. I know he's setting it up. Got it. Oops. Let's go. 
Um, Joe, since you are there in person, would you mind taking over and setting up the slide so that it's sharing on the Zoom call? Okay. So thank you also for giving me this opportunity to um, lead preschool. After 29 years in elementary school, I am now in preschool and loving it. It was such a great, great move. So thank you. So our programs in our district are thriving. They're growing. We're happy. We're celebrating together. Our families are coming together. We're building community and it just feels so right. Just as a reminder, our funding, these are things you've heard before. We have fee-based options. We have CSPP, California State Preschool Program. We have an after-school program for 24 students, CCTR. Um, that is a child care uh, situation for some of our families. Um, we have grants that are offered through the county. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Please give us a moment while we try to remedy the situation. And apologies, you now have permission to share, but I cannot locate the specific presentation that we are sharing currently. If you could assign that to the shared screen and thank you. Thank you everyone for your patience. Okay, so 
Um, we always have different grants that are offered through San Mateo County. Um, one of the ones that we have is QRIS, the quality rating uh, system that we are using to improve our teaching practices. So we look for these grants. We have another grant that we're getting um, for early educators that we are using for our inclusion. So we have our preschool programs. This is probably something you've seen at numerous times. So I won't go over them right now, but we have um, different types of programs in our district. Uh oh, there we go. Okay, so at Turnbull, our Mandarin immersion program is fee based. Our Spanish immersion program, our, these are fee based programs. Um, at George Hall, we have an inclusion program. San Mateo Park is play based. And in our, our Montessori schools, our North Shore View on Parkside. The area that we're growing this year is in our California State Preschool programs. And in November, we opened our full time. 12 month program and it is going great. We are actually now adding in a second adult, a second paraeducator so that we can grow the number of students we have. We're at 16 and we'd like to have more students in, in the program. And today we just got licensed for Sunnybrae. So Monday morning, we're open our first preschool at Sunnybrae School, full time. 12 month program and it is incredible so i hope you get to stop by and take a look at it um and then in turnbull we have full-time and part-time programs um that are thriving and we are wanting to grow the program there so we have a couple of classes that we will be using to do that um here's our new uh classroom at um lead in november um, our numbers are growing in CSPP to 247 this year right now. Our numbers change every day, so it just depends on students in and students out. But we also have a waiting list that we're finally getting to. Um, all of the three-year-olds are off the waiting list now. We have some four-year-olds who are still kind of deciding whether they're going to um, want to be in a program for the next few months. But we were looking at today as this opportunity for some of our kids to have six months of school before going to kindergarten. So we are so fortunate and so happy. Um, here are some field trips our kids are already going on. Filoli was the first field trip and they hop on the bus ready to go. Um, it doesn't matter what the weather is. You'll see in one of the pictures, it is raining and pouring. It doesn't matter. We go, we learn, we grow. Um, so at LEAD, we are now hiring that second pair that I was talking about. At Sunnybrae, our second class is going to open in August. So we will have two full time programs there. At Turnbull, we will be able to open three new classes. At San Mateo Park, soon we will, be able, we will be able to open our second class. We have one inclusion there right now. And the great news is that Amy and I visited Laurel, and these are all of our title and programs schools, and we're trying to have two classrooms of preschoolers, and we will be able to do that at Laurel, where the annex is. It is incredibly big and ready for us to grow into it. So the growth is extraordinary and exciting to see. Here's the rain I was showing you. They just kept going, it's okay. A little water never hurt anybody. So just, just so you know, really good things are happening with inclusion in preschool. We're really proud of it. San Mateo County is kind of starting to look at us as the district that is showing the most growth and in inclusion. Um, some of what we're doing are expanding the inclusion classrooms. We have one at, at Turnbull, we have one at San Mateo Park, but also growing some other options and other classrooms. We have one that we just now started bringing more students into. We are bringing students who are needing speech into class. So these are students who have never had the opportunity to even be at school. They're home waiting to get into speech therapy in our district and we're getting them into classes so they can be having their speech therapy while going to preschool. So it's really a, an absolute gift for all of us. Um, we are increasing access for our community families to attend these programs. We have two therapists that are on campus twice weekly. We are using programs that our curriculum can be through all the classrooms and ensuring that we're connecting with special ed. And we have sensory rooms that our students can go in to um, uh, spend some time and keeping all of our neurodiverse students in school is our goal. Here are some of our classes and our kids, our inclusion classes. 
And one of the things I have to say, the reason why inclusion is growing so much in the preschool program is because our staff is committed to learning about it. Last year, before I even came on board, we had 30 staff enrolled in 10 evening courses. That's a huge commitment. The following year, which is this year, we have another group of, of teachers that are students, they're learning, and I'm there with them, and they're learning all about inclusion. So it's the commitment to inclusion that is showing in all the work that we're doing. Uh, the PD options that we have, we, um, I was able to take one of our grants and one of the SPED, very knowledgeable SPED and inclusion specialists offer her a TOSA program. So she's half TOSA for inclusion for the preschools and also half working with SPED preschools. So that opportunity for us to learn from her has been incredible. Um, we have individual coaching with her um, and or a consultant from San Mateo County office. So um, we have been fortunate to learn right there where the students are, where the teachers are in the classrooms and support what's going on um, there. So teachers are building confidence, there's support for students and families. And because of that, teachers are seeing a decrease in the number of special education referrals. We hired two CSs, so our community service specialist came in to support us with enrollment. So enrolling families on a day-to-day -day basis. We're not saying we're only enrolling at one time of the year, we're enrolling every single day and we're getting our families off that waiting list and into our preschool program. So it's made a huge difference. Um, one of our CSs is hired to work with families on the ASQ, which is the ages and stages questionnaire. And what this does is give teachers information about how students are doing in different areas and things that they've been learning about in their first three years of life. A lot of this is done, um, our experiences with pediatricians, we do that a lot, um, work on ages and stages. So this is something that really supports learning in the classroom. Um, our CSs also do a lot of parent engagement, which has been extraordinary for all. And the ages and stages questionnaire is something that I feel like if you, if we do this now, what we're trying to do is support students in class so that they're working on things that they're needing help in. So instead of saying a child needs to have an assessment, we're saying this is an area of growth and we're going to work on it together. So that has been something so different in our inclusion model is including all students with their varying degrees of, you know, what they're learning about, what they need support in, what they're good at. So um, the, the ASQ is done with our CSs in the office with the families. And so they can take this information and learn from it and say, here's what we need to be working on together. Um, so there's a database that has all this information for families in Spanish and our CSs are gonna support them in learning about it and reading through it together and learning about their, their children and what their needs are. They give individualized supports and activity information for families. And of course, our parent engagement through SEL, Second Step and Learning Links, these are all ways to connect families with information and to really help our families as they are just learning how to be parents of students in school, three and four-year-olds. Um, we have resources for them every time that we do any engagement. And I want to just say that I have a phenomenal team behind me. I can't do what I do without them. We have Doa who is leading the charge at Sunny Bray, our first Sunny Bray preschool. She is the teacher that is starting that on Monday. Joanne and Claudia, I couldn't do what I do at all of them. So we're in the process, Patrick and I have spent a lot of time together discussing how we can expand, how we can recruit, we need to be doing that, and retain employees. And we are definitely committed, I want you to know that, to the well-being of our preschool staff. So you'll be hearing more about that. They definitely deserve it. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Turning it over to the board for clarifying questions. I have a couple of questions. Um, 
One was, well, I don't know that they're clear. They're like question comments. You know how I do it. I'm going to wait. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll do like a question comment situation. Okay. Uh, if there's no other board clarifying questions, turn it over to Forrest to take public comment. And if we can just bring down the PowerPoint, please. Thank you, President Watkins, and good evening. I will be calling on speakers to make public comment in a random order. If there are any members in the audience that would like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature within Zoom platform now, and you will be given three minutes to make your remarks. Again, apologies if I mispronounce any names. And President Watkins, there are no members in the audience that would like to make public comment. Back to you. Thank you so much. Any members of the audience that would like to make public comment on this item? Okay, turning over to the board for comments. Uh, I'll go first. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's it's very exciting to see the growth and to see you know the whole program expand um my i have a question that's related to a comment sort of so that's why i held it to this moment um there was a lot of news before the pandemic and before obviously and also before the recent rainstorms that we had about a uh, child care desert and the idea that you know we don't have enough child care uh, so much to the degree that the city of San Mateo went ahead and uh, developed a uh, development impact fee that actually um, charged developers mm -hmm. for uh, the creation of additional childcare. Um, part of our growth in some ways is going to alleviate some of these, in some ways, the, the childcare desert that we have um, and provide additional services. And so as we go ahead and grow, this is the question, is that I know that the city of San Mateo already expended their funds, but they are looking to sort of expand. And as that is one city that we serve, do we coordinate with the city of San Mateo? Because when you look at the overall numbers, you know, it's the same population. Uh, as we grow and expand, does that sort of lessen the load or reduce sort of the need, the overall need in the community if we're are we working with the city of San Mateo or do they know that we're expanding? I don't know if they know that we're expanding, but I think that's great for us to do something about that and to let them know that we are, uh, and that we've made a big commitment to expanding our program and um, for them to know that this is happening already. And as we see, we're hoping for 10 in you know the next year or two, um, they'll need to know that. I think it will make a big difference for them. So. Okay, thank you. That <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. I'm very excited. The expansion. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you for everybody uh, for all your hard work as well. Thank you. Um, I will just share uh, my appreciation for this information and my excitement for the program. And um, I guess one question I have that I don't know if it's clarifying or just in, just curiosity, but um, if we think about the population of people that need preschool are we meeting the need or like how many more kids are there that want to be in preschool that we can't fit okay what we're doing is um even in our fee-based classes we are allowing for five state subsidized students so that we can bring in some in all of our classes um but it's still we still have a waiting list and i just was talking about that waiting list today and just learning more about it it's hard to hear that there are still 80 students on that list right now. Um, but 
what we just need to feel good about is that we are changing that every class that we open, right? So right now that number is 15 starting Monday. And then in the summertime, that's going to change once we have the bathrooms ready to go. It's, it's all based on ratio and, and there are so many rules and regulations about it. So I just feel like, yes, I would love to change the world and let's do all you know 10 that we have planned for right away and go. We need to hire people. So before we can do all that is thinking, what do we need to do to hire more people? So it's kind of backing up and saying, you know, and then I realized like we just need to go, you know, slow to go fast. And it's nice that we can open classes in November in January, we don't have to wait until summer. We can do that when they're ready to go. Like Laurel and Amy and I were just talking about, like this is something that can be, let's just say it's not done for another year. It's okay because other programs will be opening in the summer. So um, we are gonna get there. Um, I hope one day that we don't have a waiting list, but I can't guarantee that, right? So we're just gonna keep doing the work that we know we need to do and, um, I know that there are families out there that are just appreciating everything that we're doing. If I can chime in, President Watkins, from a data perspective, we took our percentages of students qualifying uh, as having economic need in kindergarten, which is in the mid 30% and said, if there are about a thousand students in every grade level, that's 350 students. The preschool program is actually a two year program. So that means there are minimally 700 students that would qualify. The state is actually expanding the time frame even beyond three-year-olds down to two and a half-year-olds. So let's call it 825 students. And many factors that we have control over, such as how many months a year this service is available, we're opening 12 month programs. That's very attractive to a lot of families who have inflexible work conditions that result in where somebody who has more economic advantages might not need a 12 month program and actually might want a 10 month program because of a variety of summer enrichment, uh, vacation, other options having to do with how they spend their summertime many of our income qualifying families desire a 12 month program but our prior model had few examples of those programs and many of our income qualifying programs were less than full day which was another reason that families may not have indicated an interest in wanting to have children attend preschool so we think what's going to happen is over the course of the next two years, as enrollment increases and word of mouth, much of this is word of mouth, word of mouth grows, the new word on the street is they'll help you register for preschool. They're opening new preschools and they're in your community. So children and families who live in the Sunnybrook community do not need to transport their child every day to Turnbull for preschool. They can walk their kids to preschool. The same at Laurel, the same at Park, the same at Lead, which are four schools that we know have substantial need. And because of the pandemic, as Trustee Chin has often pointed out, we have had a uh, uh, increase in the number of available classroom spaces because of the drop in enrollment. And this is our opportunity to utilize that space in order to serve more students. So we think that's going to happen. I think um, our plan for the upcoming year is a plan we feel good about in terms of numbers, but it would not surprise me for us to open an additional six classrooms the following year. One of the things I've been looking at just to add to what you're saying is um, we have this interesting program that's three hours. And I asked the teacher to talk to the families and see, is that really what they want? Three hours, the majority of them said, no, we need full time. But that was offered and that was what they want. So we're changing that. That's not okay. And that's not families first. That's not thinking about what their <laughs> needs are and thinking about you know, the fact that they need to be working. So instead of having two, three hour programs that is very difficult for anybody to do, it's making that a, a 12 month program or a you know, full day program so that it supports what the families need. It's listening to the families and really offering exactly what they need and giving our students every chance 
to grow and learn and, and be ready for kindergarten and what comes. So exciting. Um, I just wanted to thank you for, for sharing that last piece, especially. Um, I'm really grateful that our school district is making space and, and, and doing everything we can to get more kids into preschool. As we all know, early childhood, early childhood education is so important. And I'm glad that it's part of the strategic plan. And I'm glad that we're all um, moving forward with this and trying to meet the needs of all of our students and, I guess, if they're not in our schools yet, they're there, our future students. So thank you very much. And thank you everybody here too. Thank you, uh, Christina, for the presentation. Um, I, you know, I think one thing that just strikes me, like when I just even looked at the deck and think about um, the fact that the deck is in Spanish and English, and just, you know, when we think about every um, and, and just thinking about kind of the support that now is being provided to families as they're applying, right? Like there are barriers to entry into the system at every single place and just thinking intentionally about how we're um, taking that into account. And like you said, putting families first, um, you know, even the little things make such a big difference in terms of people feeling like this is a place and space for them. And so I'm just really grateful to to you for for that and to the team that's that's supporting all of that work. Thank you um, all so much. You know, we looked at data comparing students that have access that have had access in or in in this district to preschool. I mean, arguably like minimal access potentially, right? And how much of an impact that has on how much they're able to access their um, you know, classroom instruction in third grade, and there's no, um, you know, the, the argument is clear for why it's really important for us to focus on early childhood education and our preschool programs. And, um, and so I'm just, I'm really grateful for all of the work that's, that's happening and all of the supports that we're providing to families. And again, to hear about kind of this word of mouth, like, oh, this is, you know, this is something that's right in our neighborhood. And this is something they're going to help you along, you know, in terms of application. Um, Cause I think we heard from Dennis at a, at a point around just, how difficult it can be and all of the paperwork that you need and the medical and being able to find it, like just all of the barriers, right? At every step of the way that is, can be easy. Um, if that's not your lived experience, isn't always something that's top of mind. And so it needs to be. So just appreciate the way in which we're approaching this. Um, one thing I know that we've talked about in the past is entertaining the idea of some sort of sliding scale. We've talked about how we have a lot of students that um, um, are that are part of the state subsidized, and then we have students that are able to um, access the fee-based programs, and we have a pretty large number of students that even like very minimally miss the cutoff. And so I'm just curious um, how much that's something that's a part of the conversation currently, if it's not currently, I mean, I know there's a lot of work happening to open new schools and not, not you know, I know we can't take on the, on the world at one time. I'm just curious if that's something that's that's come up and what your thoughts we are. We haven't on. had the discussion of sliding skill, but I think it's because our numbers have been so great of families that need full-time care. So what that tells us is when you qualify for eight hours or 10 hours of care, that means that you really need it. So the state and all of these documents that they're doing, all of that it takes to fill it out, on, they tell us how many hours. So if a family is supposed to, the sliding scale is how many hours you get. Do you get six hours? Because if you get six hours, then you can stay until three and then leave because we're offering that option. So, so what, what I'd, I'd like, like to do, for instance, for this next class, this, this class that has been this three-hour program is it will be an inclusion class. So our inclusion students will leave at 1230 because that's what they need to do. That's how it's built in for inclusion. Um, and that's been what SPED has requested for this class. But then we'll have the option for leaving at 3 or leaving at 4.30 because it depends on that sliding scale. So we are, in a way, doing it. There's not many coming in, but it is by the hours that you get. Um, one of the things that we saw that we were not very pleased with is that one of the sliding scale options is sending a, a child to school for four days a week because that's all you earn as a parent is four days a week of school. 
And that's just not okay with us. So there had to have been something missing that we needed to figure out what that was. And when we found out what it was, we could help fix it and not allow that to happen. Because a child shouldn't be missing every Monday because the state says that you can't, it just doesn't make sense, right? So it's things like that that we're fixing. So we're not even at that point yet because there's so much still that we're trying to figure out to get our families into these programs. So I think we'll get there, but right now it, that's not the need. It's just a matter of getting them in for the number of hours that they deserve. Mm -hmm. Thinking outside of the box and just really being, you know, again, putting our families and our kids first and thinking about what they need and, and doing whatever we need to do to make that happen. I really appreciate that. Um, I think you mentioned this, that we have in, in some of our fee-based programs, we are leaving spots for uh, state subsidized. So is that kind of across the board and every fee-based? You know, it's not every single fee-based situation, but um, I know our Montessori programs are doing that. It hasn't happened in our Mandarin and it hasn't happened, um, has it happened at Fiesta? No, not yet. So it hasn't happened in our immersion programs for language, um, and but it has happened in our Montessori program. So, and San Mateo Park. We're filling San Mateo Park because we waited so long to fill it. So we got to the point where it's like, now it's time for our families to be able to do. So we're doing that. And it's so exciting. We brought in another adult, so the numbers can increase. You can get to 24. Um, and it's also an inclusion process. We don't have to go that high. We don't need to, but we're, we're not letting those spots stay empty. That's, I think, what we're doing differently, right, is giving our families a chance to be in school instead of just waiting. Like we had this another situation that came up where a family has taken their child out of school two years in a row in the Montessori program for an extended amount of time. We need to change that. That's not okay because another student could be in there learning. And so I need to look at it as in our school, we would never allow that. It's 10 days more onto somebody off the waiting list, right? And I think we need to think about that differently. Children need to be in school. And if you're choosing not to do that, that is a choice that a family can make, absolutely, in a fee-based situation. I think before it was, but they're still paying. But that doesn't allow a child to learn. Right. So it's thinking about things like that differently and saying we have to be about this every day. Yeah, no, I really appreciate that. And part of the, the reason for the question is, you know, I've, I've said this for many years um, and really want our us to be working on preschools that are, and we're doing a lot of inclusion in terms of our general education and special education students, but in thinking about so SES inclusion as well, um, because, you know, we've historically had essentially segregated preschool classrooms, right? Sometimes on the same campus, like you are able to pay fee base, you are in this classroom, you get this experience, you are a part of the state subsidized program, you're in a separate classroom, right, on the same campus. And that to me is, it, that is not the way that our preschools should be, you know, that we, it would never be acceptable in a kindergarten classroom to do that. Why is it acceptable in a three year old in a classroom with three year olds? Um, and so I'm really interested in how we're working to address that and to ensure that our kids have access and opportunity, um, you know, to interact with one another, to be in a classroom space together, um, you know, all of those sorts of things. And, um, and so I know that we started addressing that with some of our magnet programs. And so I, I think it's not, it's still not equal, right? We're talking about five spots. We're talking about a small number of spots still, which has direct implications for accessibility into those programs later since kids get priority, right? So like that's a massive equity issue. We think about access to our magnet programs. Um, and then, you know, it's not happening in the language immersion programs currently, which again, so um, I, I know that it's on the radar. I just want to continue flagging that I think that it's a really um, important thing for us to continue prioritizing. And again, thinking outside of the box and creatively about the ways in which we can um, create inclusive preschool classrooms um, in all sense of the word. One last is um, I've come across situations where um, in our blended programs, there are children, that, the children that are state subsidized, they leave at 12, but the other children are invited to stay. We're not doing that anymore. That is not inclusive, right? Either we all can stay or we all leave at 12. It's, it doesn't matter if you're paying or you're not paying. The whole point is it's a program for 
for our students and our families. So it's looking at every decision that we make and really asking ourselves, is this what's best for our families? Is this what's best for our students? And changing and not just allowing it to be okay. So when Sam Hill Park started the CSPP and we started being able to send kids there, it's like, please invite them till three o'clock. And they couldn't even believe that they got to stay there. I mean, it's, it's a whole thing to be able to stay and nap there. It's a full day where now you get to go work longer, you know? So that's why we're doing what we're doing. It's changing the outcome for our families and it's what they can do every day. So. Really appreciate that and looking forward to the continued opportunities. I have one more thing. Sorry, I've been talking for a long time. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about what collaboration looks like between kind of the preschool and the elementary schools, particularly as we think about the inclusion pieces, right, and ensuring that students have smooth transition, um, all of those sorts of things. Like, yeah, I'm just curious if you can talk a little bit about the that. The best news to share with you. Today was not just a win on the fact that we are licensed. For the first time ever, um, Pam and Anna Ben and myself are starting a conversation of preschool working with TK, then working with kindergarten. It's opening what we're going to be doing. Lines of communication are going to be starting now so that next year when we get into trying to build the programs that go from one to the other seamlessly, people are ready for that. So it's starting that language now. It's developing relationships. It's seeing what we're doing. So we had this incredible learning opportunity together um, as a preschool team in September. It was one of our professional development days. And I said, why don't we have TK with us the next time so that we can start learning together because that's what we're gonna need to do. We need to learn together and grow together. So it's starting, today was so exciting. The three of us were talking about how we've never been able to really do that. And here we go, it's, it's begun. Great, thank you so much. Any other board comments? I took took all of them, Ken. <laughs> all right, thank you, Christina. All right, moving on to nice seamless transition. <laughs> A nice seamless transition into special education. Yes, Board of Trustees, again, good evening. I'm Superintendent Ochoa. Our director of special education, Heather Morgan, is here this evening, and she's going to give you a um, mid-year January special education update. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Dennis. I'll wait. Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, good, good evening, uh, Board of Trustees and Superintendent Ochoa. Um, it has not been too long since our last uh, study session, but this is our mid-year update, and I've been able to include some of the requested data from that um, study session as well. We're also going to talk about some program updates, uh, fiscal updates, and staffing, as well as a CDAC report at the end from Amy Fickenshaw, who is going to call in tonight, so hopefully we can um, help her join the presentation at the end. Okay, so one of the things that we talked about in the study session in, uh, I believe it was December, uh, was that within the students with disabilities category, when we look at data, um, there was a question about, well, what does it look like when it's disaggregated further amongst our other demographic groups? And so um, with the help of Kyla Jimenez, um, we were able to um, take a look at, um, you can see these, each category is broken down. So the overall is students with disabilities, but this is different uh, demographic groups within that category. So you can see, um, and unfortunately this is covered up a little bit at the bottom. I wonder if I can move this guy somewhere else. Uh, yeah. Um, so you can see that um, with the exceeded and met categories here, and this is for CASP from last year, from last spring. Um, I've also included for your review, and then I have some data statements to kind of make that summarize this a little bit, but I did want you to have an opportunity to see this in entirety before I go forward. Um, we also, because we have access to the math data, have, oh, come on, go down. It won't go down, Why? change. This one, page down, no, no, wait, wait, there we go. Okay, sorry. 
fall math benchmarks for students with disabilities. So similarly broken down um, by the same um, demographics. Again, these are all students with disabilities, but broken down by their um, race. And this is also required or um, something that you had asked for. Um, if you take a look, we um, actually made uh, comparatively, and obviously we're not comparing the same two exams. However, we have found that our benchmarks um, do reflect overall performance on CASP. So this is very promising that it's a much larger number of kids doing um, exceeding or meeting standards in math on the fall benchmarks. Um, and then if you'd like to take further time to break down the demographics, you have all of them here. So you can see how each of those groups did respectively. Now, these are some statements that I've prepared. So um, when looking at the uh, spring 22 CASP, 17.5% of, uh, of students with disabilities either met or exceeded standards on that assessment. Then when we're looking at the fall benchmark, we saw um, much larger number of students either meeting or exceeding standards with 56% of students with disabilities. And then um, also I broke it down because this is a specific, two more specific categories that I was asked to examine. So 42.86 of our students who are Hispanic um, and also have disabilities met or exceeded standards on the fall benchmark. And 43% of English learners with disabilities met or exceeded standards on the fall benchmark. So again, we're not comparing apples to apples here because this the fall benchmark is not the CASP. However, um, historically we have seen um, a correlation between um, the, our internal assessments. And so this is promising and showing um, good, direct, good growth in the right direction for students with disabilities. Okay, and uh, program updates. So um, we discussed this briefly in December. This is something that fluctuates. And so this is again, a draft. <laughs> I can say it again, draft. Um, because as, as we start examining our class lists, which we're, we're already doing for 23-24, um, we're noticing trends in where there may be large groups of students. And one of our goals, as I shared before, was to make sure that students had access to programs in their neighborhood complexes. Um, and as we go, as our kids get bigger, we want to make sure they have classes in their neighborhood complexes, um, not just when like for a certain age group. So maybe they have a mild mod class in their complex for kindergarten second through second grade, but then they have to go somewhere else for third through fifth. So our goal was to bring a, a, a full continuum to each complex. Um, so we're still working on growing that. We're also looking at where our students with different disabilities live and trying to bring some of those programs closer to them. We do have a very, very large group of um, primary, so like K kindergartners coming in next year with mod to severe disabilities. Um, so that's something that um, we're going to try to make sure that we have enough um, classrooms to, um, you know, in, in each complex to make more, you know, accessibility and, and and where we our programs land. So this is just um, an examination of that. And like I said, uh, it's it's still a draft because we're still looking at building those classes. But um, in orange, you can see some of the changes that we're looking at. One of the changes at George Hall is that um, traditionally they've been the only school in the district that have had two grade level bands. So like a K one, a two three, and a four five. Um, and that's really not industry standard, if you will. It's um, kind of unusual and it, um, they're for different reasons. Um, we think that it would be much better to combine our K2 and a 3.5 to um, in that school. And so that's one projected change that does re reduce an FTE there. Um, and then we're also looking at adding, and I, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit later, but adding a therapeutic classroom in the middle school. Um, I haven't decided exactly on the location yet because I'm still taking into consideration things like construction and um, the other pieces of location. So we're, we're working on um, figuring out where we put that therapeutic classroom. In doing so, we could possibly reduce students in non-public schools uh, significantly because we'd be able to serve them ourselves. And so that's something that is really important um, in our program building for next year. Um, we're also looking at moving some of our mod severe classes into other complexes right now we're heavy heavy we, like in the past um, the Abbott complex has always had more programs than everyone else so we're looking at um, 
spreading that out across other complexes and adding some accessibility for students in other uh, complexes like Burrell. Okay, moving on. Okay, this is just an update on fiscal up, um, MPAs and MPSs because I know that's been a large expenditure in our department. And um, an update on the numbers. So students in non-public schools this year is 36. I have a deeper dive into this in, the, in another slide in just a minute. Um, but just comparatively, last year we had 38. This year we have 36. And right now we have 164 MPA employees. Keep in mind that's not only paras that does, it is a large number of paras. You can see here it's 137, but it also includes all of our occupational therapists, physical therapists, um, speech, 13 speech and language, uh, uh, pathologists, um, two teachers and one psychologist. And then these are the actuals comparatively down below, just for your reference, dating all the way back to 1819 and through um, 22-23 for both MPAs and MPSs. Okay. Now, this is a side-by-side, -side, just so you can see last year compared to this year. You can see we have two fewer students overall um, in NPSs. And we have some really good news because we have a, and this is not, um, not counting the possible therapeutic class. So that would even reduce it further. But just with current students in their current IEPs, we're projecting a transition of 10 students who are currently um, attending NPSs back to district programs for 23-24. Um, again, I say projected because it has to be an IEP decision. There's a lot of uh, conversation and data that needs to be looked at within those individual um, IEPs. However, um, if things continue the way they're going and students are, um, are becoming more and more capable of transitioning out of non-public schools, then we always try to bring them back um, in-house in, in with us so we can serve them ourselves. So probably about 10 fewer next year. I'm looking at a likely 26 instead of 36. And then if I could open up that uh, the therapeutic class, that would probably be additional reduction of maybe six, six or seven. Okay, and then staffing updates. Um, as you know, one of the biggest challenges for special education this year has been finding enough teachers. And so right now, and uh, this is actually inaccurate because I posted this a week ago and we've had changes already. Um, so in for resource specialists, we do continue to have one and a half FTE openings. College Park and Audubon are currently being covered by one of our program specialists. So she is a credentialed RSP teacher, but her, her um, position in our district is to work here at the district office with us supporting the department. Instead, she's um, acting as the RSP teacher at both College Park and Audubon. And then um, likewise, we have another RSP teacher who supports our department in um, private school assessments and she is placed at Beach Park temporarily. The, all of the other employees who were sort of deployed to help have been returned to their respective schools um, because we were able to hire additional staff to um, fill those positions. And then um, for other providers, I have good news. So we have no openings in special day, which is wonderful. And then actually the speech therapists um, are fully, uh, I'm gonna say contracted as of today. They still need to clear their fingerprints and get onboarded but um, we now have our fully staffed for um, SLPs as of today. So um, that is, this was accurate a week ago. It's no longer <laughs> accurate. It said four vacancies onboarding three. Now we have zero vacancies and onboarding four. Okay. And um, as I mentioned, staffing being such a challenge, we were very aggressive and very competitive in um, an early, uh, participation in um, a recruitment event in Manila at the beginning of this month. And uh, a group of us, including um, John Cosmos and Stephanie Fermeni from HR, myself, and then also um, the Nexus Solutions and Foreign Cultural Ex Exchange Consultants um, traveled to the Philippines. There's a international um, recruiting event that happens there annually. We are competing with other districts um, the entire state of Hawaii was there, uh, Monterey County was there, and a, a county separate um, from their district. So also Monterey District was there. 
Um, we made it really clear with the recruiters that we wanted to be on the cutting edge of the hiring and having the best uh, candidates. So they put us first, which was really nice. And that's why we went so early in the year. This, this event continues on for a while with districts coming in and, and on a kind of a rotating basis. So we were the very first district to interview and we gave um, very high um, demands in terms of the types of candidates that we were interested in reviewing and um, interviewing. And so they presented um, 29 teaching applicants to us and 46 para um, applicants. And we were able to contract 15 teachers and 23 paras for 23-24. Um, this is an ongoing process. And we started early because this process to get them here and matriculated takes a long time. The goal is that these teachers will be here midsummer with time to attend all of our PDs in addition to other um, sort of life <laughs> professional development so they can get used to teaching and working in the United States. All of the teachers that I interviewed and hired, um, all of them have at least a master's in special education, some have PhDs, um, and they all had a minimum, even to be interviewed, a minimum of three years of experience teaching. And we um, hired a variety of people. So everything from preschool, mild mod, preschool, mod severe, all the way through the continuum to um, single subject upper grade, uh, mild mod, RSP, mod severe. So we, we got the full continuum of teachers on board. And um, we're really excited that we had that opportunity. This is putting us in an excellent position for staffing for 23-24. So we will not find ourselves in the position that we were this year with struggling to find coverage for classrooms. Okay, and that brings me to our CDAC update. If we could bring Amy in, I think, I don't know, <laughs> Joseph or maybe, um, uh, you can leave this on. It's just that Amy's gonna call in oh. and do the report. She's our, our CDAC president. Okay, so um, is she on the Zoom meeting? Right? She is. Okay. So Boris, could you um, promote her to a panelist, please? Uh, Amy, I have already given you permission to talk. Can you go ahead? Yes, and start I, I'm able to unmute myself yeah. now. <laughs> okay, is it okay if I get started? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi. Hello, hi, um, trustees and, um, and Heather and Superintendent Ochoa and welcome to okay. Trustee Brooks as well. Um, thank you for having me tonight. I'm Amy Fickenshire, the chair of the Special Ed District Advisory Committee and a parent to two children in the district, both receiving special education services. Um, CDAC has had three meetings so far this year, a back to school meeting where we discussed who's who in the special education department, the purpose of CDAC, how to get involved, and who to reach out to if you need assistance. This year, we've also been sharing a list of community events and resources at each meeting, typically parent education opportunities from organizations such as the Family Resource Center, Parents Helping Parents, and Disability Rights California. Our last two meetings have been community education presentations. They were both very well attended and impactful for our community. Both Jennifer Maiman, the CDAC vice chair, and I have had many parents reach out to us following these presentations to let us know that the content was helpful and really resonated with them. In November, we had a presentation called Creating an Inclusive Culture Through Neurodiversity Affirming Practices, presented by McAllister Greiner when she's a National Board Certified Special Education Teacher from North Carolina, and um, also known as the Neurodivergent Teacher on Facebook and Instagram, if you're interested in following her. Um, we had about 50 people in attendance, and that included parents, general education and special education teachers, speech therapists, school psychologists, principals, and other community members. Um, because this presentation was so impactful, I do wanna tell you a little bit about what McAllister discussed with us. She defined neurodiversity and discussed that without intentional shifts and in practices, inclusion is the exception and not the rule. We're in a truly neurodiversity affirming and inclusive culture, inclusion becomes the rule. She shared that an inclusive culture is accessible, student-centered, anti-biased and reflective. And she provided examples of this for us in the school setting, in the community and at home. 
She also shared some simple shifts we can make to increase inclusivity, such as instead of thinking this student will never be able to do this independently, to shift your thinking to what supports does this student need in order to experience success. The presentation was shared throughout the district at some site level staff meetings and also with the inclusion task force. So we were really grateful for the presentation from McAllister and also um, to have so many people in the district have access to it. Our January meeting was this past Tuesday and another community education presentation about autism and pathological demand avoidance or PDA presented by Casey Ehrlich, a PhD and parent of an autistic child who fits the PDA profile. We also had about 50 people at this meeting and it was also attended by teachers, staff, administrators, parents, and community members. Casey talked about the PDA profile that includes a survival drive for autonomy that consistently overrides other instincts. It's often triggered by demands and a perceived loss of autonomy. She spoke about what we can do to best support students, emphasizing focusing on connection, communication, and building trust, the use of trauma-informed practices, and being flexible with routines, materials, and expectations. Trying to rationalize with a child in a moment of nervous system dysregulation, such as being in the fight or flight mode, can be triggering, and to instead work to de-escalate and co-regulate with the child. She also provided us some great resources further explaining PDA and strategies for families and teachers, and these can be found on the CDAC meeting archive website, along with a recording of the meeting. Um, both this, the session on PDA and neurodiversity affirming practices included strategies that are helpful for neurodiverse students, but all of these strategies are helpful for children of any neurotype. Um, again, we, um, we really wanted to bring in people who could provide our community with really meaningful content um, and not just parents, also um, the larger community, including teachers and staff. Um, we have a couple meetings coming up. Um, March 21st is the district's LCAP engagement with CDAC as the stakeholder group, and it's an opportunity for parents to provide feedback to the district. We have a potential April meeting date, which um, is to be confirmed, but it would be a community education presentation from Changing Perspectives, which is an organization that promotes disability awareness and self-advocacy through family workshops, staff trainings, and professional development. Changing Perspectives has a contract with the San Mateo County Office of Education, so they've been giving similar presentations to our neighboring school districts as well. And our final meeting of the year will be on May 23rd. Um, topic TBD, but an end of the year wrap up, I'm sure. Um, and finally, I wanted to talk a bit about how people can find out more and get involved with CDAC. We have a opt-in mailing list that you can join on the CDAC website, and we send this mailing list meeting announcements, share community events, and resources that come up between CDAC meetings. Again, all of the meetings are recorded. Um, these recordings, slide decks, and other resources are all posted to the CDAC meeting archive site. Um, we are always looking for more parents to get involved with CDAC. Um, this could include helping find speakers for CDAC meetings, working on outreach to people in our community who may not know of or be attending CDAC meetings, and helping to create a parent support group. Um, later this evening, there will be a first read of a board resolution to prioritize diverse student needs, and if approved, this resolution will include the creation of a special education policy review team. The team would be tasked with analyzing existing policy, recommending changes, and identifying new policies. It would be made up of at least five members, including parents, administrators, and classroom staff. So this is another way that um, parents in our community can get involved. And I'd like to thank the district for drafting and considering this resolution. And then finally, um, to connect with me or with Jennifer directly, you can email us at the San Mateo Foster City CDAC Gmail account. Um, and we check that email um, a couple times a week. So please feel free to reach out. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to provide you with the update tonight. I'm excited about the work that we've done this year and for what's to come. And I am available to stay on for any questions about CDAC and the work we've been doing as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. So, uh, let's see. That's it. it can't go down though, I don't know why. <laughs> No worries. Thank you so much. If we can, hold <laughs> that's basically the last slide.
So thank you. Okay. Awesome. Uh, we'll turn it over to the board for any clarifying questions that you have for Heather or Amy. We should leave Amy in as well as the panelists for now. Um, okay, I'll go first. Um, thank you for the presentation. It's down a little bit more. Oh, sorry. It's a little... Okay. All right. Go yeah, no problem. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, on your slide, um, that you don't need to pull it up, but it was talking about the fiscal updates and implications, and it talked about the 164 MPA employees. Uh, and you have a, uh, an asterisk here that says approximate numbers may fluctuate. Just to clarify the question, these are our employees or these are employees that are also contracted out? And all that is already. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other question, I, I have comments, but I will save them. The other question I have is the Philippines recruitment. Um, from my understanding, this is not the first time our district went out over to the Philippines. It was like 15, 20 years ago, when was it? 15. 15 years ago, okay, thank you. Um, I'll save my comments for that, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I had a question that um, I should have asked ahead of time. So if you don't have the answer, my fault. Um, on the NPS comparisons, we have two two less students than last year. However, the um, the financial amount has gone up by 1.2 million, and it seems like that's by far the largest increase year over year. So I was just wondering if you knew um, what that increase is associated with with Patrick and his team um, doing it like a, a very deep dive on um, the cost increase. But one of the things that has happened in the last year is that many of the agencies that we partner with, um, their costs went up almost 25% in some cases and some even more. Um, those contracts are not contracts that we um, like approve the limits on. That's something that happens at a, a county level. Um, but we are going through individual case by individual case to see if Maybe we've over encumbered a little because like, like I said, this is a mid year, so it's not actually an end of the year actual. Um, so we are looking to see if like if it's, first of all, obviously it's going to be due to the increased costs um, of some of our MPS schools went up. I, one of the biggest ones that we partner with went up, I think it was close to 30%. So each of those students, huge increase in the um, tuition that we have to pay for them. Um, and then in other cases, we're looking to see if there's any um, like line items that maybe are still in there for encumbrances that don't need to be. And we're going to try to reduce those POs and remove them if they're um, not accurate. Any other board clarifying questions? Okay, Boris, let's turn it over to uh, any audience members have questions. For us to be turned over to Yes, thank you, President Watkinson. Good evening. I will be calling on speakers within the public to now make public comment. Um, to our attendees, please wait until I open the floor for public to raise their hand. And then once I do, please use the raise hand feature within Zoom now, and you may do so now. Attendees will be called on in a random order and will be then given three minutes to make their remarks. Uh, you will hear a tone for when your time begins, when 30 seconds remain under your time, and then again when time expires. And once time does expire, we will move on to our next speakers. And apologies in advance if I mispronounce your names. Uh, Anya, I am going to start with you and you are now have permission to talk. Please begin when ready. Thank you so much. I want to start with thanking Amy. Um, I miss not getting to come to CDAC this year, but I look forward to coming next year. You guys have had amazing presentations this year, and it's been so wonderful to see it grow so much and just all the speakers you're bringing in. Um, as someone who's had the privilege of working in this district for a while and teaching at another school that had multiple grade bands where it was two grade bands per class, 
and being there for that transition. I definitely hope that there'll be a lot of support. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes, we can now. Okay. Um, so I just, I wanna thank Amy for her wonderful presentation and all she does with CDAC. I've missed coming this year and I look forward to it next year. It's been great to see it grow. Um, as someone who's had the privilege of working in this district and at a school where we did teach two grades and then there when it collapsed into three grades, I really hope the George Hall teachers get a lot of support because it really affects the ability to successfully mainstream and collaborate with gen ed colleagues. The difference between two and three grades is a pretty big adjustment. Um, and it really does impact your collaborative planning time. Uh, I also just want to bring up some concerns that I hope everyone takes into consideration for bringing in the new teachers from the Philippines about what guarantees they're going to have in getting the support for the visas so that we don't have some of the issues we had last time around where teachers are ripped out of their classroom mid-year because the district didn't follow through on the paperwork and their visas expired. I think that was pretty hard on families and on students and on the teachers themselves. And I really hope that that is something we can fix this time around, as well as making sure that, you know, these pairs are bringing in considering how much, you know, ex the expenses that they have to cover to do everything. And then we're paying them $20 an hour compared to the agencies that we're paying upwards of 26. So I do hope those are all things that get taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Anya. And Amy, I see you have your hand raised. If you would like to make a public comment, you can do so now. Please unmute yourself. And if that is a mistake, I will move on to our next. No, thank you. It's not a mistake. I wasn't sure if you were talking to me or the other Amy who has her hand raised as well. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to make a public comment as well. I wanted to start off by um, thanking and appreciating the team for consistently providing data in these updates over the last few years, over the last year or so. Um, in past years, it was very much lacking. And so seeing this data over time um, has, of course, brought to light the achievement gap that exists for students with disabilities. Um, I believe we're ready for a step further. My hope is that in the future, in addition to data, that these updates could include specific action items and plans that the district will execute upon to work to close the achievement gap. There's additional information about special education that our community would like to see shared. How is the achievement gap, gap being addressed and what does it look like at the classroom level? What can we as parents expect to see change in our children's day-to-day -day experiences? My ask really is for more visibility and shared information about what is being done to improve programming, implement best practices, and ensure that all students feel safe and a sense of belonging in their school communities. The part of the larger picture that we're not seeing right now is the actual school experiences of the children that this data represents. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for your comment. Randy, I'm going to allow you to talk. You will have three minutes to share your thoughts. Please go ahead and unmute and begin speaking when ready. Hi, good evening again. Um, so first of all, I was really encouraged about the information about the visit to um, the Philippines and um, seeking that out as a creative solution for staffing. Um, I was curious about um, Trustee Chin's um, um, comments and insight into this was an effort that was made 15 years ago. And I'd be curious about, uh, and then the um, Anya's comments about what happened previously and some more just information sharing about, you know, what were the outcomes with that effort previously? And, um, you know, what, what that we can anticipate that that will look like um, this time. Um, and then um, just two more things. So, uh, I appreciate um, the update that Amy Fickenshire provided, and I really appreciate her comments about the data that were um, that were introduced. And you know, there were some comments that were made, especially about the internal assessment and those results that were shown. 
I just wanted to comment that um, that uh, Heather Morgan said, and I'm sure that this is something that she was told, that we've seen a correlation between the, the internal assessment and the CAST results. And I just want to emphasize that, and, and she pointed out that this was that this isn't an apples to apples um, comparison. The, there is systematic bias in that comparison, that even though they're correlated, one is extremely optimistic, overly optimistic, and really isn't something that should be kind of shared as results um, that are indicative of much. If, if what you really care about is the standardized assessment, which is the uh, CASP assessment. You're, you're weighing the internal assessment way too much. Um, and then finally, for the, um, the NPS results, those are interesting. And I have a question about um, presenting NPS data. Now, there are um, families, students that I know of in our district who have um, uh, you know, settlements with the district that their students are receiving their education elsewhere. And those are schools that are not listed on that sheet. And so when there's, when there's some sort of settlement with the district and the district is paying for their student to receive their um, education elsewhere, where is there an accounting of that so that the public can see um, those assignments as well? Not, not down to individual um, you know, students or family level, of course, but just where that spend is. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, moving on to our next commenter, Marcella, you are now allowed to speak. Go ahead and unmute and begin when ready. You will have three minutes. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Heather and Amy for the thorough uh, presentation. I think uh, especially, uh, ha again, having those data-driven discussions matter so much when we're talking about special education. And I also wanted to recognize that um, the work that CDAC does, uh, and also for developing the resources on the websites for those of us that can't always make the meetings, it's a big, big shift from where special education looked a few years ago. It allows for a level of discourse that would not be possible without CDAC. I would encourage the district to offer those materials on the CDAC page in another language. I know that the text on websites can be translated, but uh, flyers and slides cannot. Um, one of the other aspects that I noticed is how many paraprofessionals we hire. And uh, I am curious as to the services that the paraprofessionals provide uh, with a continued caution uh, on ABA related services, we continue to see the trauma that students experience uh, and, and share with us about their experiences with ABA. I know it's a controversial topic, but if we think about disability justice and how we are serving students, um, I, that it, it's an area that I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about. Uh, and then as I think about speech language pathologists, since that's an area that's close to me as a speech therapist, um, I, I know we have a challenge in, and it, this is a, a nationwide challenge, but um, as we think about our, um, as we think about the provision of speech services from a virtual perspective, there are only certain students that, um, for whom virtual speech therapy is effective. And so um, I hope that we are keeping a really close eye on who it is that is receiving those virtual services. Uh, it's exciting that we're fully staffed, but when a lot of our staffing is has to be contracted, it ends up impacting the district in terms of both finance as well as turnover. And with regard to speech as well as teachers, um, I would again encourage the district to review your connections with your local colleges of education. I know I've tried to work with the district to bring in a closer connection. It makes a big difference um, when our educators or specialists come from the local area. And as we think about programs in the Philippines, I'd also love to know if there are other 
areas that we can um, review that are reflective of our linguistic and our cultural community within this district. And then one last area that doesn't always get addressed is the 2E exceptional. So students that are identified as exceptional in multiple um, categories. I know we lost many of those students before the pandemic and during the pandemic. And I'm curious about how special education looks at those students. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Jennifer, I am now bringing you in and unmute you when ready. You will have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Um, my comment is in reaction to the slides in the um, special education update reporting on the 36 kids attending NPSs. Um, it feels like these 36 children and the schools they attend are reported on at every board meeting where special education is discussed. There are over 1,000 kids in this district receiving special education services, and yet these 36 are always called out and are only described in how much they cost the district. I'm a parent of one of these 36 kids, and to hear my daughter referred to again and again as a cost, and as a cost that the district would like to reduce, is very hard to hear. Children and families with an NPS placement have been through trauma, trauma of not being able to be supported at their district school, trauma of being placed far away from home in some cases and away from their friends and community. By continual, continually calling out these kids and reporting on how much they cost you, you are discounting their experiences and the experiences of their families. The reality is the dollar amount that the district spends on NPS placements and NPA services will never be zero. Just like there will always be children in our district who need speech services or OT or physical therapy or RSP, there will always be children who need smaller environments, specialized therapy, specialized teaching modalities. What's important is that we're giving children the supports they need to succeed, regardless of whether that is at a district school or an NPS, and regardless of whether those services are provided by district staff or staff from a non-public agency. The way that the cost of these services and staffing these positions is scrutinized and discussed comes across as an inconvenience and financial burden for the district to provide instead of a legal obligation. As part of a shift towards more inclusive practices, I urge the district and the board to reflect on the purpose of special education services. Because just like pencils, desks, teachers, and buses, they're core elements the district provides to help every student succeed. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, Amy Connors, thank you for your patience. I am now unmuting you or allowing you to talk. Go ahead and unmute and begin speaking when ready. You will have three minutes. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Um, I, I, thank you. Um, I, this is Amy Connors and I appreciate the moment to speak. Um, I first wanted to say thank you to Heather and the special education department, and most especially to Amy Fickenture and Jennifer Maiman um, for all the work, especially Amy and Jennifer as volunteers, um, doing what they do to support the special education community and our whole community. Um, I wanted to recognize that after, um, I know many, uh, many challenges in um, communication and getting the word out, um, it has been nice to see in the last um, couple of months, um, more special ed and especially CDAC announcements coming out in the mainstream communication from the district. And I think that's wonderful to see and it's important to get that out to everybody. And I would encourage that to continue and to increase. Um, I'd love for principals at schools and for teachers to be able to share that information and continuing to let the whole community know not just when CDAC is meeting or presenting something, but um, who they are and um, what special ed is. I think that um, it's important to remember that those that are in the special ed system um, need the information and should definitely be targeted for that. But it's also very important for families that might be looking for how to get support for their, their student or how to advocate for their student that they are considered part of that special ed community when we're thinking about these presentations and communication from the district standpoint. And so I thank you for what's been done and ask that that continue to increase so that everybody in our community has access to this wonderful information. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And with that, President Walken, there are no more members of the audience that would like to make public comment. Back to you. Great, thank you so much. And thank you everybody for your comments. We appreciate 
turning it over to the board for any comments that you have. Um, I will make a couple comments just quickly. Um, I wanted to just thank Amy Fickenshire for her comments about um, kind of what's next after we look at this data. And so when we've talked about this data in other arenas, we say, okay, we're doing math boost and reading, you know, reading intervention. And so I just would um, be curious kind of what are the next steps now that we have seen this. And um, I want to just make a quick comment on talking about um, budget and costs. And I think that when I am presented with information, I'm going to ask questions. And so seeing a large increase in dollar amount between two years, I think that's something that if I didn't question it, I would, I'm not doing my job. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that um, we shouldn't spend the money or it's not needed or we should cut costs. I'm just, it's just information that I have to question when I see it. So um, I appreciate all the information you shared and look forward to more. Okay, um, thank you for the presentation and thank you, Amy and, and Jennifer as well for uh, all your hard work on the CDAC. Um, couple of questions. The first question or comment I'm going to make is about the CASP and our internal assessments in the fall. Um, they are, as, as we had in previous, not just special education, but when we made these comparisons, they are sort of apples and oranges, but I think they're good indicators. Um, and they are maybe optimistic. Um, but I look at it, and especially your two bullet points here at the end on slide, I don't know what this is, um, but it's a slide after the, um, after the charts. 42.86% uh, of Hispanic students with disabilities met or exceeded standards on the fall benchmark, and 43% of English learners with disabilities met or exceeded the standards on the fall benchmark. Uh, when we look at just the CASP, that is only respectively, I think, five and 6% of um, Hispanic uh, students and then also English learners. So I'm, I'm all for the data showing that if, if we even get close to this, I mean, I think it's fantastic. You know, obviously it's not the CAFS data, but even if we are going to 10 or 20% or 30%, I think that is, that's great. And the idea that these are true indicators and then I'm really excited. And, and very optimistic about it. So um, I hope they come true. Uh, we won't know until we get the next uh, the next cast um, results in, but I am optimistic about it. Uh, going down the presentation, uh, when was the last time I guess we were like fully staffed in some ways? Yeah. I think we were last year. I, I have to look last back year. at the numbers because okay. it changes so quickly. But, but I know it, it fluctuates basically like month to month. Oh, day to it's day. It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah. It fluctuates crazy. So I, I'm, I'm really happy that, that we could say it at this moment in time. Um, and then my comment about the, the Philippines, I remember in, it was either 2018 or 2019, we did a site visit to Sunnybrae, one of our school site visits. And um, Dr. Roses at the time had introduced us to, I think it was either two or three of the paraeducators who came over from the Philippines in the first time that we went. And I thought it was fantastic because as, you know, with special education, the idea is it's a very hard position to keep. And these people had been with us for years and had made families here and, and settled in and had their roots, uh, you know, grew up here, had the kids actually, I think went through our system too. So I'm, I'm excited that we've, we're reaching out or trying to, to do this in terms of uh, fill our positions. Um, I know that I think it was a city of the Redwood City School District that did this two years ago. And so I know that this is not uh, uncommon in Santa County. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited that we can fill that many positions. I'm also cautiously optimistic on it because um, there is other things to think about like visas, housing costs, and you know, just the, uh, you know, the assimilation into our, in our community. Um, so I'm hopeful that, that we can, you know, everyone can come over and we keep them for years. 
Um, but I'm cautiously optimistic on it. But I, I'm glad that we are actually reaching out, thinking about how we can fill these other positions in different ways, because part of the problem uh, with special education is the constantly changing or revolving door of the staff, uh, whether they're contractors or not. Um, I, I know it's a very difficult job. I have a friend in San Francisco who was a, a, a high school teacher for mod to severe, and he's been doing it for years. And he's had to, he's had to take several breaks because of just the, the stress. Um, and so I know it's a difficult, difficult position and also difficult for parents too. So um, I, I'm very glad and very happy that we've done this and I'm, I'm can't wait to the next uh, presentation. So thank you for all your work. Now I'm unmuted, thank you. If I can chime in here, um, wanted to um, just discuss being a data-driven district. As a district, we are always going to take our internal levers, in this case, our math benchmark assessments, which were created um, by some very talented folks who work in this district with uh, a great deal of expertise in math, specifically with the intent to um, approximate the rigor of what kids face on the state tests. At the same time, taking an exam for your teacher comes with it a series of components that makes a child feel comfortable, safe, supported. It's their teacher giving them a test. When kids take a state test, it's more high stakes. And there's absolute research on the impact of high stakes testing on students' ability to demonstrate their mastery. So there's always a difference between uh, what an internal exam um, given by a teacher who's developed trust with the student based on how students are learning and then how that child performs on a standardized test, but we won't pick and choose the things that we report. We are going to report the data and the data is there for um, all of our review. And it reflects something very important that's happened. And as you know, in the presentation, we focused on our math benchmark data. It reflects an important shift in this district that's taken place that is a real, um, it is a true feather in the cap of this board and of the um, extremely talented leaders and teachers in this district who have all participated in a shift in instructional practice related to math. As you all know, we made those shifts last year in sixth grade in a very significant, purposeful, and intentional way to discontinue separating children and to align resources to create math coach positions to um, introduce new instructional strategies. And we saw gains in sixth grade math last year. That program has now been implemented in third grade and seventh and eighth grade this year. So the results you're seeing reflect the purposeful shift in instructional practice, which is very difficult to do. Aligned with a willingness to take on um, as a district, the substantial cost of bringing these resources to bear in our classrooms. So it's exciting to know that children with special needs and all children in our district are having increasing uh, opportunities to learn um, in a way that's engaging, that gives them opportunities to think critically, and in a way that doesn't separate them from their peers um, for reasons having to do with um, factors outside their control. So we're, we're just very excited about that. Thank you uh, for the presentation and Diego, thank you for um, that additional information. I think um, just echoing what, echoing what some of the public commenters shared about, um, you know, being grounded in the data allows us to have conversations that we wouldn't be able to have otherwise. And I think it's a really important place to be. I also just want to acknowledge that I, I think the gist of what I got from some of what folks were sharing as well is that we do that in uh, combined with 
being student centered as well and acknowledging the fact that behind our data are kids um, and individuals. And so I think, um, you know, that's definitely a, an important, I think, call out for us as we continue to be data driven and how do we um, also really stay student centered. So appreciate folks um, sharing, sharing that and, and the impact that it's had. Um, I think one general question kind of to echo what uh, I think Amy shared and then also what Trustee Proctor shared. I think, um, you know, as we look across so many of these things, um, we're looking ac across kind of the data for our students with disabilities, just really thinking about how are we making the connections across? So then what does it mean? What are the programmatic implications? And what are the staffing implications? And um, just that really that connection and that through line. So we're thinking about, we know that this is what the current state is. And so then what does that mean that we're doing um, as a result of that? And, you know, this is to say that like, you know, we've had conversations and conversations with Superintendent Ochoa and there's a lot of incredible stuff happening as we're thinking about this data. And so like, let's share some of that work that's happening and um, and involve our community in, in celebrating and also sharing where it's not working and how we can improve, right? And so how do we continue to make those connections and just be really clear about kind of that through line? Um, you know, I think is really important. And the same is true, I, I would say for, for example, like the NPAs, when I think about, um, you know, I know that there's been a lot of public comment and some board comment previously around kind of those numbers and wanting to address that. I mean, I think it's it's exceptionally complex, right? Like, so there's a story there around, are there things that we haven't done as a district or that we could do better in order to increase the number of students that are able to be successful in our district? And it, I appreciated you sharing a little bit more about kind of what we project in terms of students, right? These are, we've but there's more of a story there too, right? These are the things that we've done in order to facilitate students being able to return back to the district. And here's how we plan to ensure that they're supported and our educators are supported, right? As, as we're making that transition. Um, and, and sometimes our district isn't the right place for a student for a variety of reasons. And that's always going to be the case as well. Um, and so I think, again, just really um, that story around kind of the nuance there, I think, um, it sounds like it's something that our community is asking for. So I look forward to how we can think about doing that as, as we're moving forward. Um, so that was just kind of one overarching piece. And then um, I feel like I have another question and I'm not finding it in my notes now. I think that's it for now. I know we've, yeah. Do you have anything, anything for me, Trusty Brooke? Okay. All right. Well, oh, Thank you. <laughs> I think we're gonna take a four minute bathroom break. We'll be back at 810. Mic, mic check. All right, we are ready to get started again. Thank you all for your patience. We are moving on to 8A, review of proposed equity task force resolution, the first reading. And thank you, President Watkins and members of the board. Um, we're excited to bring this item to the board this evening. Um, part of the and we still have the screen that says board will return shortly. So if uh, our tech staff can assist in getting um, an update to that screen and I'll give it just a minute here um, before we jump into it. Before the board this evening is a first review of a proposed equity task force resolution. Many, many thanks to board president Watkins Nancy Bowie, our Director of Equity and Inclusion, and David Chambliss, our Assistant Superintendent of Education Service, who um, 
took a great deal of time and effort to put together this initial draft for the board's review and for the public's consideration, review, and input. Um, part of the process of taking a thorough and um, well-considered uh, resolution forward is making sure that the public has sufficient time to review it and digest it and um, think critically about it and forward those questions and those ideas to those responsible, in this case, uh, Nancy Bowie and David Chambliss. Um, as you can see in the agenda item itself, um, it is a lengthy resolution. Uh, you won't uh, be surprised to see that um, as a rule in this district, uh, as in terms of a resolution, it is not simply a um, statement of our feelings or opinions, but rather it is a clear declaration of our expectations regarding outcomes and our systems to monitor and achieve those outcomes. Um, of note, it is very, very um, um, transformative to see that among the priorities listed in the resolution are the collaboration and consultation with other existing task forces in this district, the monitoring of the district's strategic plan, the connection to resources to achieve these equity outcomes, and of course the um, demand that communication related to these outcomes be a, uh, a part of our system to achieve this equity. Uh, so with that, I want to give members of the public an opportunity to ask those questions and also uh, turn to the board for questions and comments regarding what I uh, believe to be an extremely powerful um, equity task force resolution that shows the um, the real learning and knowledge related to the initial equity task force resolution and uh, with the expectation that over the next 30 days, um, those comments from the Board of Trustees and from members of the public um, can be given their due consideration and possibly um, implemented as is determined necessary by the board um, for potential approval at the February 23rd regular meeting of the board. And with that, I'll turn it over to the board. Great, thank you so much, Superintendent Ochoa. I will turn it over to the board for any clarifying questions that you have. Um, I think my only question, I, I think this is great by the way, but um, some of these action items, is there a timeline for when they're gonna be done or what's the expectation? Looking in the section titled, um, Be It Resolved, there are um, strategies that are expected to be developed um, and implemented. And so you'll you'll see um, under the district staff actions, um, item number two is listed as develop and implement a rubric to analyze the equity impacts of board and district policies and review analysis at a board a special study session each December. This will have been, if the board were to approve this in February, the initial implementation of action item number two under this section would be December of 2023. So the expectation would be that this work take place, assuming board approval in February, by December. Uh, so each has a um, a start time that aligns to when the board approval of the resolution would potentially take place. At the same time, uh, item number five, as an as a second example, um, in the task force, 
itself and managing membership and working with other advisory committee, the uh, work can start much sooner. We wouldn't wait until December for an item such as that to um, be initiated. And so that particular item might uh, commence in April, as an example, as opposed to um, taking an additional eight months uh, to begin the work. Are there any other board clarifying questions? Uh, Forrest, if you could open up public comment on this item, please. Yes, thank you, President Watkins. And if there are any members in the audience that would like to make public comment, please use the raise hand functionality within Zoom now. You will be given three minutes to make your remarks. And Randy Painter, I'm going to bring you in first. You are now allowed to talk. Please unmute and begin when ready. Hi, good evening again. Sorry for having so much to say tonight. But um, so uh, one question that I had on this um, on this resolution. So on page three, um, on the the second, be it resolved on that page where it says the district staff. So there is a um, there's a lot focused there on um, developing and implementing. Uh, the rubric, right? And so one thing that I just wanted to ask about here was maybe recalling this incorrectly, but I think back when um, Trustee Watkins first introduced, um, you know, the, the first draft of the equity, uh, I think of equity resolution, is that if that's what it was called, and I think this was in 2018, um, when she introduce this. I mean, this concept of this rubric was very clearly in there. And this is one of the first things that district staff came and pushed back against in, um, in that iteration. And they said, oh, we can't do this. We couldn't do this. How could we ever do this? And so that was one thing that kind of dropped out of the list of priorities. And so I'm wondering, are district staff on board with this? And is there a vision laid out for this? And so is this coming up from the district that that are from the staff that they want this now and that they're on board? Or is this something that's coming down from the board, from Trustee Watkins, from superintendent? And um, it's something that I'm, I'm personally, I'm happy to see because I think it's important for accountability and having a standardized way for evaluating um, equity impacts. But, you know, it has to be, it has to be a very carefully and deliberately done process as well. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Moving on to our next public comments, Marcella, I'm now allowing you to talk. You will have three minutes to share your comments. Go ahead and unmute and begin when ready. Thank you. Um, I just had two quick comments as we think about the committees and groups that are feeding into the equity um, task force and the resolution. These are more process related comments. Um, I feel that it is very important that students are involved in a meaningful way in this process because we are a K through eight. Um, I think that we can look at all the data we want, but in terms of implementation, the student voice is going to play a big role in a lot of these issues of equity. And then the second piece is, again, in the composition of the committees and task forces, I would encourage everyone involved to think about how to actively recruit those people who are not traditionally represented in this process. I think that um, often these committees and, and who is on them are more reflective of people who know the system, people, people who are sitting listening into the board meetings, people who, um, you know, it, it's almost like an opt in if you know how to connect with the groups. And I, if we're thinking about equity and equity of voice, it becomes really important for us to not only have 
rigorous application processes for these types of committees or, or these types of groups, but really think about how to invite those voices in um, much in a similar way as, as uh, Superintendent Ochoa did for strategic planning and for many of the other uh, initiatives that he engaged in when he first got here. So just two little kind of process um, points that I hope we keep in mind as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And with that, President Watkins, I have no other members in the audience that wish to make public comment. Back to you. Great, thank you so much. So the board uh, will discuss now. I'm actually gonna start if that's okay with everybody. Um, um, so grateful that we're here discussing the second kind of iteration of this. As mentioned by Superintendent Ochoa, I had the opportunity to collaborate with Assistant Superintendent Chambliss and um, Director of Equity, <laughs> Nancy Bowie. Um, I'm like, what is your official title? <laughs> um, uh, on this resolution. And so to Randy, to your comment, you know, this is a um, I guess, yeah, five years later um, since the first equity resolution and a very different district um, than was at that time, right? Introducing the equity resolution at that time was very much kind of something that I brought to the board. And as those of you that were around then, right, like it was the first time we'd really looked at a resolution that like had teeth and there was a lot of, um, it was challenging, I think, for like us as a board to rally behind that, for district to, to figure out kind of how to work with resolutions presented in that way that, um, you know, had kind of some really clear next steps. So um, there were, you know, if you go back to that resolution, there are definitely things in that resolution that didn't happen, some of which, uh, you know, Randy, you pointed out around, around the rubric. Um, and I think what's exciting about the second iteration is the fact that this was collaborative with our, um, you know, with with myself and and our district staff, so we could really kind of ensure that um, that what was realistic is also, and that what you know there that there's alignment, and that there's a sense that you know we're all really rallied behind this. I know I'm speaking for the two of you; you guys are welcome to jump in, but I think that I can say that we're all kind of behind everything that's here and are committed to making it happen. Um, the other thing that I'll just say is that you know I think um, this I you know we've talked so much in the strategic plan right is this effort to have everyone kind of rowing in the same direction and we've talked so much about um, just alignment and there being a through line and I know that that's something you know I personally bring up quite often and I think the ability of having kind of this overarching grounding body that's able to really um, serve at, as kind of um, to 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 uh, to be that umbrella organization or body that kind of encompasses many of these other groups is going to be such a powerful way to move forward and to ensure um, that there is alignment that 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 groups do not feel like they're working in silos that there's a way to kind of filter so many of the incredible work that's happening across a variety of different task forces um, and that that there's alignment between those things that folks aren't doing the same thing without visibility right all of those pieces that are just really important that marcella to your po point around student voice right the composition of the equity task force is still going to have student voice and so there's an opportunity and ability for that group to say and we want student voice on all of the time right we are meeting with every single task force and we think that this is something that's really important we have some parameters that we're setting around how we want um, outreach to happen to be a part of this and what composition looks like right like there's such this opportunity to really um uh to to just ensure that there's cohesiveness and to ensure that there's really strategy and and then to ensure that um you know, the folks that are on some of these other committees really feel like their voices are um, being heard and that it's, and so I, I'm just really excited about the possibility of this group to really, um, to really bring together, to bring together all of the stakeholders and to, and to, and to continue building on the incredible work that's happening kind of across the district. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing how the rest of my colleagues feel. And I just really will quickly say thank you so much, David and Nancy, for all of the work that you did putting this together because they 
did a lot of it. And so I'm really grateful to you. I'll go. I'll go. <laughs> I just want to give you guys the opportunity to go instead of jumping right in. But um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dave and Nancy in the back there for working on this. Um, uh, it is, is definitely moving when we talk about sort of alignment. You know, President Watkins, you're absolutely right. We're just a completely different district five years ago. You know, it's completely different. I, and I look around the room and think like, actually, Heather, <laughs> so she's the only one who might be been here five years ago, right? Oh, sorry, Dennis. Yes, Dennis, sorry, Dennis, thank you. Um, and so I'm, I, I'm just really excited about it um, and think about what has happened already and what has been done and, and where we're gonna go in the future. So I am, I am excited. Um, I do not have any, comments per se about like the structure or anything else like that. There's just one sort of word uh, comment and I, and I don't want um, just on page two and I'm happy to give my two cents and if you guys want to take it and run with it, that's fine. Otherwise, if you don't, that's okay too. So on page two, uh, number equity priorities. Uh, when you go down the list and you see establishment monitor allocate number three, Allocate resources to achieve equity. Um, the paragraph actually provide, it's, it's providing guidance because I, I don't believe this committee or the task force can actually allocate resources. So my thought would be to the review the resource allocations to achieve equity or something like that because um, there's, I mean, I don't think we can even allocate. So, so that, would, that would be my only comment. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I think. Um, uh, you know, I just think it's it's the next step and where we're going. So um, thank you for everyone who's worked on it. Any okay. Yeah, no, I'm gonna, I was just making sure I didn't jump in front of anybody. But, um, Thank you, President Watkins, for your leadership and for um, all your work on this. I think it's great. And thank you to everyone in the district that's also worked on this. Um, I, I like that, you know, we have this strategic plan. We've been, you know, kind of moving in that direction. I like that, that we're bringing this back to equity and kind of resetting um, our priorities and our focus and I and I'm glad that it's in writing here I, I I also wanted to just say that I really um appreciate the fact that the equity task force is going to be collaborating with all these other um task forces and committees I think that's that's wonderful um I don't really have any comments other than I'm excited to see um where we go from here I'm I'm glad that this is going to be more formalized with the the rubrics and everything that we can really um kind of see some consistency and so thank you Thank you, President Watkins. I just would like to thank everyone for uh, working on this amazing plan. And I look forward to uh, experiencing the results. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. And this will come back um, at our next board meeting for approval. All right, moving on to another resolution, <laughs> uh, propose a special education resolution. And thank you, President Watkins. I'm here with our Director of Special Education, Heather Morgan. Uh, tonight's proposed first read of the special education prioritization resolution comes from a collaboration with members of our special education CDEC leadership, as well as President Watkins and Trustee Proctor, um, who have put in a considerable amount of time um, 
working through multiple drafts of this document. Um, as a district, we're far down the path um, towards equity and inclusion. And tonight's item is an acknowledgement that for students with special needs, there is more work to be done. And that work is being very uh, specifically described in this resolution and this proposed reg resolution, I should say. Um, much of what we deliberated on as a committee uh, working on this proposed resolution was trying to find the right balance between feeling hopeful about what we could achieve in the future without ignoring the um, opportunities we've missed in the past and acknowledging what structures may have contributed to those missed opportunities and how many families in our district have wanted for years our special education system to be more and more responsive to their needs and to their children's needs. And that's what we intend this resolution language to help us accomplish over the next several years. Um, what you'll see in the language itself is similar to the equity resolution that was just discussed and um, served in some ways as a, a benchmark for us in this special education work to see a very, very well thought out um, resolution that uh, was brought to the board in 2018 and uh, um, similar to the Sanctuary Task Force resolution that was brought to the board. And from there, um, continued analysis really of, of how we operate as a district. And tonight's resolution for prioritizing the diverse needs of students um, comes with an agreement to conduct deep listening sessions to go out and engage with our community, our multilingual community, our um, Foster City, San Mateo, Highlands community, um, to really draw out as many families as possible and participate in this work, um, and to connect it to the inclusion task force that's currently working at the district level um, with recommendations for years 23 through 27. Um, a very exciting component of this work is, uh, again, similar to the dismantling the school prison pipeline work that took place last spring um, that allowed us to adopt some innovative um, policies related to conduct, discipline, questioning and apprehension, and a variety of other um, board policies related to the school to prison pipeline. This resolution calls for the establishment of a special education board policy review uh, committee that would engage in very similar work that would be uh, cross collaborative and um, has some very specific benchmarks and timelines for when new policy will be recommended to the Board of Trustees. Um, and then as you look uh, further down the um, document, you'll see examples of the type of data collection and data reporting that we expect to include as part of this resolution. Um, as a former special educator, I can speak for many of my colleagues here in the San Mateo Foster City School District in saying that this resolution gives me hope. Um, we certainly um, know what our starting point is as a system. And at the same time, what is exciting about this resolution is the manner in which it calls for broad community input because to each family, their experience in special education is unique. And this resolution takes into account the uh, uniqueness of the experience that each and all have with um, special education in our district. And at the same time, has the right balance of innovation and introspection and 
the systems to facilitate what we believe a true growth in the uh, quality of experience our children with special needs will um, will benefit from in the San Mateo Foster City School District. Similar to the equity task force resolution uh, presented just prior, this is for information and for discussion. And uh, I encourage members of the public to really read through and think about this resolution. Um, and I want to give the school board an opportunity to ask any questions and to engage in the initial public discussion of this proposed resolution. And with that, I'll turn it over to the board. Great, thank you much. Uh, so much, Superintendent Ochoa. I will turn it over to the board for clarifying questions. Seeing none, uh, Forrest, if you could ask for public comment, please. Thank you, President Watkins, and good evening, everybody. If you would like to make public comment, please use the raise hand functionality within Zoom now, and I will call upon participants in a random order. Again, you will have three minutes to make your remarks. And again, if I mispronounce anyone's names, I do apologize. Uh, Anya, I will begin with you. You are now able to talk. Please unmute and begin when ready. Can you all hear me? Okay, I just, I really hope that this time you truly take the heart, take to heart the actual listening to the community and to the parents. Um, some of you were there the very first time I spoke to the board. I spent my 30th birthday with you guys and advocating for my kids. Not really the best place to spend a 30th birthday, but I thought it was important. And time and time again, when parents stand up to the board and advocate, when teachers stand up to the board and advocate, when they go to the district, we're often ignored. And so I really hope with this resolution, the listening and then acting upon what you hear is taken to heart. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Randy, you now have permission to talk. Go ahead and unmute when ready. You will have three minutes to share your comments. Hi, good evening again. Uh, I really, really appreciate Anya's comments and they speak to one of the things that I wanted to, um, to address in this resolution, which is um, the concept of conducting these deep listening sessions, which is, um, you know, exactly what Anya was talking about. And, you know, being a data-driven district, data certainly comes in quantitative aspects and that's the easy way to really capture data, to capture information. There's a whole other uh, world of information that comes in terms of lived experience, that comes in terms of what you hear. And it's a challenge to capture that and distill it. And that is, you know, broadly termed qualitative data analysis. And there are methods to doing that. And I really haven't seen this district go about that in any sort of systematic way. And I think that if the district could incorporate systematic ways for, um, for capturing those data and analyzing those data, the district could do a better job at that deep listening and making sure that they're capturing those themes, the, that contact. Because as Anya said, it's really, really important and people bring their rich lived experiences. Now on to the easy part, which is the, uh, the quantitative data analysis. I see some, some things here in the data that they are going to be, that, that you propose to, um, to report that I think would illuminate um, some, some interactions that if they were collected and, well, they are collected, but if they would just be recorded on, could, um, could reveal important insights if you commit to report on those. So it's not just to disaggregate the data by race, ethnicity, but also to disaggregate the data by um, uh, socioeconomic status as one thing and by EL status would be another thing. And even the, um, the interactions between those. 
So just a suggestion to put out there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Moving on to our next audience participant, Marcella, I am now allowing you to talk. Go ahead and unmute and begin when ready. You will have three minutes for your comment. Hi, thank you. Um, as we're thinking about language in the um, resolution, there are a couple of, of things that caught my eye. Um, one of the ways that uh, David Chambliss talks about gaps that we see in terms of academic scores is um, opportunity gaps as opposed to achievement gaps. And um, I always value that kind of language, a recognition that there is something not necessarily in the students, but really in the opportunities that we're providing them. And I think that language matters as we develop resolutions and kind of make statements as a board. And then uh, again, just kind of a simple process uh, question. I note that there's discussion about systematic screening and early identification for infant to preschool, but also one of the best practices in the state of California um, that is recommended in the state of California is universal dyslexia screening in kindergarten. And um, as we think about catching any areas that can be ameliorated uh, as early as possible, if we are putting language in about systematic screening and early identification for young children. I'm also curious about um, our current processes and intended processes with regard to dyslexia screening um, at a young age. Thank you for your comment. And with that, President Watkins, there are no more members of the audience that would like to make public comment. Back to you. Great, thank you so much. Um, we'll turn it over to the board um, for comments. I do before that actually just wanna um, give a really, uh, a thank you to Amy uh, Fickenshire who was really instrumental. I know uh, Superintendent Ochoa mentioned that um, and helping to shape this in addition to uh, Jennifer Maiman. So thanks to you both um, for your, um, just push to, to kind of do this and, and collaboration in the process. Um, board comments. Um, I can speak briefly on this. Um, just, you know, I, I think that having this resolution, um, to me, it means we're committing to doing better by the students with um, in special education. And I think that, um, you know, we've had comments in the past and we have we continue to have them where, you know, there there may be data presented and we leave off special education students off the data or or we leave, we forget to talk about them in conversations. And so I want to just make sure that, you know, this this is a commitment by everybody on the board and the school district to make sure when we talk about all students, we're talking about all students. And so I'm I'm really looking forward to hearing about these deep listening sessions. Like I wanna know um, what I don't know and what's, what's going on. And I wanna make sure that families and students know that we truly care about them and we want to hear what's going on and we want to we want to do better and so um i'm also really looking forward to the policy review and having this task force that goes through policies i i really enjoyed you know i i um sat in on a few of the equity task force meetings when they were talking about reviewing the discipline policies and reviewing board policies in that in that sense and i'm looking forward to hearing um from this task force on how our policies can better suit all students. And so, um, you know, I think we have an opportunity to do better and I'm looking forward to doing that. So um, thank you to Amy and to Jennifer and to everybody that was involved in this, Trustee Watkins, Heather, Superintendent Ochoa. Um, I think that this is a positive thing and I hope that, I just hope that we can, um, like I said, do better. So thank
Um, thank you for, for, for working on this. Um, I, I would definitely think it's sort of like the next step in terms of where we're moving as a district to, to pass this resolution. Um, my one sort of comment about it is in comparison to sort of like the equity task force uh, resolution, and I, and I don't see it here, but when we talk about sort of alignment and like organizational alignment and where we're going, we reference this, the strategic plan that we just adopted and everything sort of goes back to the strategic plan. And unless I missed it, and I was trying to scan this while trustee uh, Proctor was doing this is rereading it again. Um, I think it's there, but it's not like mentioned. I think that there's elements there, but I feel like it, there could be a stronger tie to the strategic um, strategic plan. Um, otherwise, I think I think it's great. I think it's 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 where we're moving. Um, I absolutely agree with Trustee Proctor about you know what we have done in the past and and where we've been, and I also feel like you know I think Superintendent Choa, I think you you know. When you came on, I mean, this was a big thing that that we needed to focus on, and I think that this is just another step in that direction in terms of trying to trying to tackle um, this topic. I I also think that um, you know, hearing what the the public has talked about, I, I think that um, you know, I I'll just say that I think um. All of us here up at the dais, I think we hear and we, we listen to, to all the public. Um, if we don't necessarily, I think there's this misnomer that if we don't say anything or if we don't like agree or shake our heads or something else like that, that we don't care, that we don't, that we haven't heard you. Um, but we do. I think there's a lot of conversations that happen afterwards where we may not actually say something in public or might have someone else might have said instead of repeating it, we, we don't. And so um, I, I just want to say that we do hear you. Uh, we are listening, um, and I, I think this is this is part of how we're moving forward. So um, I'm very excited about it, and I, you know, I, I don't have any other changes beyond the you know that comment about the strategic. Mm -hmm. So, thank you, Trustee Proctor. Um, reviewing this document is very promising. The work that has been put into it is what is needed and appreciated. Um, all who have worked on it, thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to um, the results that we'll see from the great work that has been put into this. Thank you. Yeah, just echoing a lot of what my fellow uh, trustees said um, with, with gratitude. Um, so thank you, Heather uh, for and, and Superintendent Ochoa. And then I know I mentioned Amy and Jennifer as well and, and my fellow trustee uh, Proctor. Um, you know, I think as I am thinking a little bit about some of the public comment and just in general, right, like years of public comment, I think one of the things that was really important to us as this resolution was drafted was to acknowledge that the experience that people have had in our district in trying to advocate for their students and trying to get the services that they deserve and that their children need, um, you know, and it's it's I think it's hard as a as a district, as an organization, right, to put on paper, you know, sometimes that you haven't done everything that needed to happen in order um, to serve students well. Right. And I think we're doing that a lot more now because the only way that you get better is to talk about where you're starting and to acknowledge the places where you have room to grow. Um, and so I just appreciate the fact that this resolution is framed in kind of acknowledging that very real experience, because I think, you know, we can, to, to some of the points of the public comment, we can do all the listening that we want, but if people don't feel like they're really being heard, or if people, I mean, the change part is like separate piece, but um, 
uh, you know, it just, it's, it can be really challenging. And I think that there's been a history for folks um, of just really, I mean, almost feeling gaslit a little bit in this kind of uh, where, you know, is my experience really not happening because this is what is being said maybe at a board meeting versus like what's happening on the ground. And so I just, I think the acknowledgement that, um, and there's been so much work that's happened like already um, with you, Heather and, and Dennis and all of your leadership to address that and to acknowledge, again, I mean, building off of Christina's presentation around like to put families and students first, right? Um, and to really think about like, um, what are ways we can say yes and what are ways that we can really address the needs um, in, in the most um, student and family centered way possible. But I think that, you know, acknowledging kind of where we might not have always done that, I think is a really important place to start. So I kind of just wanted to say that. And then I think, um, you know, I, yeah, the, the listening sessions are going to be important. And I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think I brought this up at the last special ed, um, presentation, but, you know, we had the audit a few years ago. I don't remember how many years ago that was four years ago or whatever, where, I mean, it was a, a lot of sessions and I think, you know, part of the frustration comes with like, well, we've done this listening and like, what's, how does it actually filter back into like what we're seeing, what I'm seeing for my student in their classroom, right? When I drop them off on the first day of school, like how does this audit in this listening that you've done? And so then it feels like you're not being listened to, right? And so I think that there's, you know, as my fellow trustee said, there's a commitment on behalf of this board and our district staff to listen and then to act, right? Um, and to really think about, I mean, there's a lot of things I think we already know um, that need to be addressed as evidenced by this resolution. And there are things we'll continue to learn around the, along the way. Um, and, you know, that will be, um, and yeah, yeah. so I, I just, I'm excited about the direction of this. Um, I agree with Trustee Chin's point around, are there ways that we could more uh, um, deliberately align to the strategic plan in our language? Um, I, uh, Marcella's point around the dyslexia screener, I think is really valid. If we could just add that explicitly into the screening and early intervention. Um, I think that that would be great. Um, and as well, just ensure that, you know, our language is really, um, we're just examining for, you know, bias across our language. And, you know, um, again, this is a first reading. It'll be, it'll be up for um, a vote at the next board meeting. Um, so if there's additional comments that, you know, folks have, you're always welcome to email us or, or district staff and, you know, um, there's the possibility for adjustments to be made. Just, yeah. just one final comment just on, on this resolution, the last one. Um, if we do make changes, uh, can we uh, post a redline version of it so that we can actually see what the um, before and after changes were? All right, moving on to our final resolution of the evening. Uh, a, a resolution to fill board vacancy by provisional appointment and established procedure for the appointment of a provisional board member. Members of the board and members of the public, uh, tonight's recommendation is for uh, the express purpose of filling the vacancy created by uh, Trustee Noelia Corzo, who, as we all know, now serves on the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. Many congratulations to her and thanks for her service to this board um, over the years. And with that resignation notice, the vacancy um, becomes available in uh, service of the Board of Trustees. And what is provided to the board this evening for your discussion and consideration and uh, our recommendation um, is to approve this resolution is to do so in a manner that allows for a provisional appointment in lieu of a special election. Um, and the reason for that is uh, to ensure that the district uh, has the appropriate representation on the board without the necessary cost and time associated with a special election, which is significant. Um, the education code does allow 
um, school boards to consider these options um, and to do so in a public meeting such as tonight um, in a manner that allows for the board to arrive at a decision on the best path forward within a 60 day time period ours beginning on uh, December 31st when the resignation by trustee uh, Corzo went into effect and so um, included in tonight's resolution um, is a recommendation that the following take place those would include the announcement uh, in local newspapers as well as on the school district website uh, and through means of communication to all families the vacancy itself it is important to note that though the district transitioned to um, elections by trustee areas uh, close to two years ago that uh, trustee Corzo was elected at large which does mean that uh, a potential candidate could live right here next to us in uh, Foster City or up in the Highlands neighborhood or in any part of San Mateo or North Shoreview um, and still qualify for filling this provisional appointment for the next uh, just under two years. And so those uh, uh, individuals who are interested in serving in this uh, capacity should the board approve this resolution would then submit their application to uh, the superintendent's office myself and uh, our executive assistant uh, Tatiana Sandoval are available to assist anyone who requires that assistance that timeline opening should this pass tomorrow and closing February 16th those applications and documents being put together and organized and candidates being invited to our regular board meeting on February 23rd at 5.30 p.m. Um, for the board to engage in an interview of the applicants and a voting on a provisional appointee as well as a swearing into office of the selected individual. Um, the school district administration strongly recommends that the board take this action this evening uh, and allow the uh, announcement, the uh, application process, and the public notice to um, be implemented effective immediately. And with that, I will turn it over to the board uh, and community for questions and comments. Great. Thank you, Superintendent Ochoa. Uh, turning it over to the board for clarifying questions. I have one, which is, um, are we able to, if uh, the if the board is interested, um, agendize a special study a special session, board's uh, session, to talk a little bit more about what the process could look like on at the February, whatever, 23rd meeting. Thank you, President Watkins. It is my understanding that as a board, um, you would be able to create such a special study session with the express purpose of further discussing the um, interview and application process. And I um, would ask for the board's uh, uh, forbearance and being able to to consult with legal counsel and getting a, a definitive answer to that question. But I, it is my understanding that that is a possibility. Are there any other clarifying questions? Okay, uh, turning it over to uh, Forrest for public comment. Keep forgetting audience, unless there's any audience public comments. Thank you, President Watkins, and good evening. I will be calling on the public to make a comment in a random order uh, to our attendees. If you would like to speak, please use the raise hand feature within Zoom now, and I will be calling on audience members in a random order. Once again, if you are dialed in on a phone, please hit star nine in order to use the raise hand functionality on mobile. Uh, speakers will be given three minutes to talk. We have our first participant, Randy Painter. I'm going to allow you to talk. Please unmute and begin when ready. You will have three minutes. Hi, good evening again. Yeah. Um, so I'm super curious about um, this process, how the questions that are in the, uh, the agenda came to be. 
And um, yeah, you know, I, when I remember that when this uh, was an issue back in 2018, that there was a, um, a questionnaire that was developed. I think that um, Trustee Watkins was involved in developing that questionnaire. And there was a huge variety of responses that I think the 17 or 18 applicants, um, at the, those responses were all over the board. And then I didn't see how any of those uh, responses were actually incorporated into the evaluation of who was moved forward in that process. And so I'm just, I'm just wondering, like for people that are going to um, take the time to uh, answer those questions, not, uh, what's the purpose? How did those questions uh, come to be? And it, it just, it's, yeah, just have you, have you thought about what that process is gonna be and what you're asking of people before they actually step up and you're asking them to do this? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And with that, President Watkins, we have no other members in the audience that wish to make public comment. Back to you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Superintendent Ochoa, if you wouldn't mind just addressing kind of where the questions came from, and then we, um, I'm happy to talk a little bit about process next steps, or you can talk about process next steps. <laughs> for members of the audience, there was an echo in here, so it's always uh, difficult to track when that happens, but um, the California School Board Association uh, produces a um, a pretty extensive set of materials recommending um, possible interview questions in a provisional vacancy. This is this is a very common um, uh, instance, and we as a school district administration are recommending these documents for the board's approval with the knowledge of how we might tweak it to meet the school district's um, reality, the school district's uh, situation. And you'll see in the question, there is specific mention of wellness, achievement, and equity, which as you all know, are your three goals as a school board. So some effort has been taken to, uh, by district staff, uh, myself specifically, to um, adjust those recommended questions in a manner that acknowledges uh, the San Mateo Foster City School District's uniqueness, but also maintaining sort of a standard uh, uh, bearer um, approach to, to creating the documents. As it pertains to what the board might do regarding deliberation with the answers to those questions, I think that individuals who would choose to follow through on the process would uh, likely have a deep passion for serving the community and serving um, the vision and the mission of the district. And uh, each would bring to it their um, specific um, individualism and their um, rationale and their um, their intent in serving in this capacity and uh, how each individual school board member would interpret those responses um, would be something that um, in your role as elected members um, I'm, I'm smiling at you all here. <laughs> this is what you were elected to do is to, uh, you know, to apply your, um, your analysis, your, your best thinking on how the responses uh, these prospective candidates would give um, balance in, uh, in their potential service to the students and staff in the San Mateo Foster City School District. So there, were, I wouldn't necessarily suggest or recommend any ranking or scoring or numbering um, other than each individual school board member um, making that consideration of the responses themselves. And then also acknowledging that at the interviews themselves, there will be an opportunity to hear directly from these potential candidates. And, and that would be our recommendation as well. 
Great, thank you, Superintendent Ochoa. Um, and just just to clarify, there's kind of a, a two part or two step process. There's the kind of written application. And um, last time when we did the appointment, um, everyone that submitted a written application went through an interview process. So it's not like the written application is a screen. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just it's just to provide additional context. Um, the last time that we did the appointment as well, um, we did meet as a board um, and talk a, talked a little bit about process aligned on questions that we wanted to ask during the interview. Um, and so I would recommend that we find time for a special study session. Um, when Superintendent Ochoa confirms, and if we're not able to do that, I'm wondering, yeah, I just, I, I wanna make sure that we have an opportunity to do that um, before we actually get to the interview process and then we're able to share those questions in advance with candidates um if you know to to the extent that that's I don't I don't actually remember if we did that last time can you might, you, you might remember I don't know if we shared questions in advance but anyways if we're able to just align on questions we all want to ask things that are really important to us to have people speak about and then kind of the process that we want to follow um I think it will be really helpful and then can just be as transparent as possible So I'm in a completely different position than I was last time. Um, I so I'm going to touch just on the their special study session in just a second, but um, uh, I don't necessarily have a problem with with any of the questions or the application um, that was presented or the resolution. Um, but as I was thinking about just pure logistics of this. Um, I'm wondering if we actually have enough sort of time. Um, you know, we've changed our board meetings where we do a study session to be, you know, one one meeting, and then we have a very large meeting like this one. And so the issue is, in comparison to the last time, we had meetings every other week, and so the the, the actual while the meetings might have been long, there was less items on there. And so um, one logistical issue is I wonder whether or not we're going to have enough time if we only start at sort of 530 on the 23rd. Um, and I say that coming from experience, because when I went through it, whether it was 18, 19 or 20 applicants, it was an eight hour public interview right here <laughs> in this room. And so um, that's a long time. And I, you know, I. I hope we have a lot of applicants. Um, if we don't, um, we'll have, it'll be shorter, um, but I do worry about just the overall logistics of it. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, becoming a trustee is, you know, just like city council, it's, it's a big, it's a big position. It's an appointed position. And um, in some ways, I know that it's set up that we would have this item at the very beginning of the of February 23rd meeting. And then whoever's appointed will be able to come and sit up and you know take the oath and everything. Um, I'm almost wondering whether or not we want to logistically do it like where there's a, a break or something, or maybe start our meeting later because whoever that person is, it's it's a nice to have like their family come and, and there's some pomp and circumstance sort of to it. So uh, versus if we had sort of the eight hour interview, there's just, there's no real like, it's like, that's it sort of thing. And they immediately just come and sit up on the board, on the dais. So, so I, I don't know whether or not we shift and say, okay, we're going to start the interviews like at three o'clock and, and sort of maybe push our meeting to like six or something. So there's like a little break for anyone who wants to come over who we choose. Or we do it on the day before, but the day before is Ash Wednesday. And the day before that is the day right after um, President's Day. So I, I don't necessarily know. Um, where we'd want to land on this, um, but I bring it up as a logistical concern. Um, and then to address um, President Watkins, your your comments. Um, I, I think that, and I remember last time that if we do go ahead and have a special study session meeting about questions, um, like of course, Anybody who can listen and, and watch will know exactly sort of what we're thinking, which is which is fine. 
because um, that's sort of the public meeting part of it. Um, I don't necessarily know if there are questions beyond these here that we want to ask. I haven't thought about it. Um, I'm I am thinking of uh, the city of San Mateo's uh, appointment process that they just went through. Um, beyond, besides all the um, the extracurricular stuff, you know, there was there was the application, and then each of the applicants got up and had like ten minutes to either share what they already written or share something new, and then the council members just basically asked any clarifying questions. So it was anything a little bit more, um, and I found that kind of to be helpful. Um, because if we were just going to meet to ask additional questions, then we might as well just put them on the application, you know, now, sort of. Um, so I, I, um, I'm in a different position here, but those are just my overall thoughts at the moment. I'm happy to hear, I um, hope to hear what everyone else thinks, because, um, yeah, thanks. President Watkins, if I can chime in briefly, we do have some very talented legal counsel. And as a result of your comments just a few minutes ago, they, they do uh, maintain an alertness when we are in a board session. And I did send a message. Our legal counsel did confirm that, yes, in fact, the board is uh, um, authorized to hold a meeting for that express purpose and that doing so. I, I would recommend to the board that we consider having the... Yeah. My apologies for that. Please continue. Okay. All good. Thank you. Um, that we uh, that we as as a board president um, and in collaboration with myself, we um, look at some dates to be able to hold such a meeting. Also, maintain the flexibility to be able to have district reports that would normally be given at the regular meeting in February to perhaps be added to the special meeting that we hold. As you know, uh, these information items can take uh, 15 to 20 minutes each, um, considering the presenter. Um, some people take longer than that. Isn't that right, David? Um, and so um, that's an inside joke, by the way. And um, so uh, that might actually move about an hour to an hour and a half into that special study session, thereby ameliorating the concern of possibly not having enough time when we do convene uh, for those interviews, which I would recommend that we keep on the regular board meeting um, date and time. And then ultimately that would be action items and consent and then the interviews for the provisional uh, trustee. Um, I was going to just say that, um, like, I want us to cast a wide net, and I would like to make sure that everybody knows about this position so that, you know, people that aren't always paying attention um, know that there's this opportunity. And so I um, appreciate that we're going to be putting the information in the newspapers. Um, maybe there's other opportunities to get the information out. Um, I don't know if the cities would help share the information or if there's other ways to get this information out to other people. Um, the other question or idea I had was, um, I don't know if it's possible to do sort of a board community workshop where people who are interested in the position could come and there's two school board members there, the superintendent, and, and not to like, for us to, know who's applying but more to answer questions and provide information all in one forum um i can imagine that there's going to people be people that reach out to us individually um, but maybe that would just help people that are interested in learning more about what is what's it like on the school board so i don't know if there's time for that but um it might be helpful um yeah that's all Sounds like Allison would like to host a board meeting. Tax season. <laughs> Any other board comments on this?
So I would like to um, allow the applicants uh, or as a suggestion to uh, be able to share uh, some special information and it be allowed in addition to the uh, questions that are being asked uh, so that we can um, uh, get a better idea of uh, something special that they want to share and um, that can be unique and different from what every applicant has to answer. I mean, they're all being asked the same questions, but to give something special, I think is important. To clarify, do you mean something like um, an additional information, just like a space for people to add anything else that they would like to say? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Is that okay with everyone else? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So if we could, uh, and, and Superintendent Cho, can you um, summarize what you see as next steps here just to make sure we're all aligned before we move on? Absolutely. Um, the district's recommendation to the board is to approve the attached resolution, which outlines the process of the public announcement and uh, the interview date and time um, and uh, the addition of a um, of a format or additional question to allow those to provide more information about themselves and context um, at the same time separate from the vote and the approval of this proposed resolution should the board choose to do so myself and President Watkins would coordinate according to board policy um, to schedule a special study session for the purpose of giving the board an opportunity to dig into how the interviews themselves would take place on the 23rd um, during our regular board meeting. And my recommendation would be at that special session to include the uh, board agenda builder uh, pre-identified reports to the board, which for that month include human resources, uh, communication, formative assessments, and um, those would then naturally give more time at that regular board meeting on the 23rd, albeit that action is separate from the resolution, but it is you know, a summary of, of what we've just discussed and um, I believe is going to put this board in the best position to be prepared on the 23rd, uh, all with the same understanding of how that evening would um, take place and have enough time to give each individual their due. Um, I also want to just make a plug for those watching or uh, now or later. It might not be an eight hour interview. It might be a seven hour and 45 minute interview. If people who don't like long interviews, it might just be a bit shorter. It was eight hours when uh, certain people interviewed but it does there's no requirement that it be eight hours long i've seen some that are three hours long we can always one can always dream uh awesome okay does that work for everyone also i'm realizing i was the only one on the board when we did our last appointment <laughs> Just clarifying question, does anything that Superintendent Ochoa, does anything that you mentioned have to change the, the resolution that we're about to approve or is it? No. Is, okay, thank you. Okay, if we are good, then I will take a motion to approve the resolution. Uh, Superintendent, should that, Ochoa, should that motion include the update to the form? No, that's a, um, that's a staff function separate from the resolution. Perfect. Second. Thank you, Trustee Procti, for the motion. Trustee Chin for the second. All those in favor, please unmute and say aye. 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 Great. Four zero. Moving on to item nine, board member statements and requests for future agenda items.
Uh, you want to go? You want me to? You want me to go? <laughs> um, I yeah, I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the um, the tragedies that our local community have faced, in addition to our respective um, communities in Southern California, um, and just the challenging time in general that I feel like, um, you know, our students and our families and all of us, right, are experiencing right now. Um, I, uh, you know, we recently talked about a lot of the work that our district is doing to support student wellness and the increase in, you know, counselors and social workers. And, um, you know, there's a variety of reasons um, for that, and I'm I'm grateful that our students have um, and families have access to additional support. Um, and you know, devastated that we continue to need these additional supports um, to support our students and families through unimaginable tragedies and experiences. Um, so I just wanted. To to be sure to acknowledge that and, and particularly to acknowledge that the impact that that's had on our Asian American Pacific Islander community. Um, and um, so if, if I don't know what resources that we've already um, kind of put out as a district, but there, if there are other things that we can be doing to ensure, I know that we put out a statement um, and I'm sure that at the site level that our district, uh, that counselors and social workers are ensuring that they're um, checking in with students and families that are particularly um, in need of additional support right now, but just putting in an additional plug for continuing to do that. Um, and for our teachers and staff, um, you know, if there are ways that we can better support you, please do not hesitate to reach out. I'm just going to echo um, what President Watkins um, said. I think it's um, it's incredibly hard. Um, you know, you see this stuff happen throughout the United States, and you know, when you think what just happened, okay, in in Monterey Park, you know, and then for it to happen like basically ten minutes away from us or so, um, it's really hard. Um, and it's 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 very difficult to sort of comprehend. I, you know, we have families who, you know, you know, for some reason, one reason or another, are actually over in that community who are part of our community. We have teachers, a lot of teachers who live on the other side of the hill. Um, Half Moon Bay is actually a very small community, and it's and and the coast is is. It's a very tight community, and it's it's really hard to to imagine that this that this just happened on the other side. Um, I would sort of echo the, you know, I think the the statement, um, Superintendent Ochoa, that you sent out, I think it was a couple of days ago, or was it yesterday, um, with the resources. I think those, I think people should definitely um, uh, take advantage of that if they can. Um, my um, my daughter's who's in fifth grade. Her teacher actually lives on the other side of the coast, um, and her son goes to Hampton Bay High School, as my brother used, did as well. And it's um, you, you drive by this section all the time, and it's hard. Um, and talking to your kids about it is it's you know you every parent has to sort of like make their own call and on what how much they share. But it's um, it's a difficult situation, and I and it. It's it's unbelievable that we are sort of still dealing with this now. So um, I don't know. I would I would say that you know when we talk about you know mental health and um, and resources and and what our our children go through, our students go through, and providing all these additional resources. I think you know you know, whether it's because of the pandemic and everything else, but there's mental health is a, is a real situation. And I think if people, we need to recognize that. So, um, yeah. But I just wanna, I, I don't know, 
it's it's hard. Um, this is very hard. But just want to know that if there's people who need support, there's support out there. We provide support. There's lots of other support, and, and it's out there. So um, I hope everybody um, takes advantage of it if you need it. Um, um, on a, well, I guess I'm slightly segue off of this to a, to what I thought was going to be a happier topic, but I just want to wish everybody a happy Lunar New Year. Um, it is a, uh, it is, you know, the Lunar New Year, um, like Chinese New Year for me, and um, and but other other um, ethnicities and races celebrate different New Year. So just wanted to wish everybody a happy New Year. My heart goes out to the families and the children in the community affected by these devastating events uh, that has recently um, surfaced again. Uh, very tragic. My heart goes out to the API community. Mm, stand with you in this difficult time. Hopefully things will turn for the better very soon. Shifting, um, seeing the work that has uh, been moving forward in this district, I'm very proud to see it. Um, happy to see the difficult and challenging um, conversations that uh, has been needing to happen and they're happening. Thank you for that. Um, things are looking really good. I'm very excited to be a part of the team. Back to you, Brett. Hey, we will move on to future meeting dates, which are listed here. We have a board meeting that we just talked about at uh, February 23rd and a study session on February 9th on Yes. Um, just on the future meeting dates, um, just speaking about the logistics of the interviews, um, if if there's a way to maybe take advantage of that study session, we add half an hour on or so to do some official business or something like that, that might um, uh, make our interview meeting more efficient and more timely. Just a suggestion. Thank you, Trustee Chen. Um, Ah, we will open up any, uh, open up for public comments on closed session before the board recesses to closed session. So Forrest, if you could open up public comment, please. Thank you, President Walkers, and good evening, everyone. If there are any members in the attendees that would like to make public comment, please use the raise hand functionality within Zoom now. You will be given three minutes to make your comments, and I will choose upon attendees in a random order. Again, apologies if I mispronounce anyone's name. And with that, President Watkins, there are no members and attendees that would like to make a public comment. Back to you. Great. The board will now recess to close session. Do I need a motion for that? No, right? Okay. All right. We'll be back.
Y'all need to be on, right? Oh, okay. Reporting, returning from closed session with one thing to report, the Board of Trustees unanimously approved an offer to settle the litigation San Mateo Foster City School District versus David Swift et al. The district agreed to release all claims in exchange for a payment of $70,000 by defendants David Swift and Shiloh United. I, we are now adjourning. I will need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Trustee Chen, for the motion. Trustee Books for the second. I, All those in favor? Sorry, just point of clarification. I think, don't we need to say it was voted this item? I did. I did? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Point of clarification. Sorry. 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 I did. Sorry. All those in favor say aye. 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 This meeting is now adjourned. Aye.